we should see some progress on inflation in the coming months. If you think the U.S. has an inflation problem, Europe has a much bigger one. Real purchasing power has declined over the course of the last 24 months. There's going to be a realization here that the economy is not collapsing. The markets haven't done anything. So no one is right, no one is wrong. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Let's get you to the weekend, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio, alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Rambert. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Your equity market is slightly positive on the S&P 500. Is the bumpy road to nowhere starting to go somewhere, TK? I think something switched yesterday. You know, we can go and it's going to be fun here through all the morning to talk about equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. John, pick your weapon. You were taking a break yesterday. You're on sabbatical. Lisa and I noticed the two-year yield going out to 4.23 percent that's a change from the snooze fest of the last four Just days for the record i think i talked about that repeatedly on yesterday's program Probably. you retire for four straight <laughs> sessions monday tuesday wednesday thursday this is what stands out for me before you get too excited chairman powell almost nine months ago in jackson hole wyoming talking about pain pain that we were all looking for over the next nine months that morning the s p 500 opened 4198 the s p 500 closed yesterday 41 98. Let's go back to the chairman's words back in August of last year. Higher interest rates, slower growth, softer labour market conditions will bring down inflation. They will also bring some pain. But a failure to restore price stability would mean far greater pain. Tom, unemployment last summer, 3.5 percent. Unemployment now, 3.4. It's, it's been a stability and it's a changing idea. We've had 47 Fed speakers this week and we've got a big, important meeting today. But the answer is, John, we've migrated forward to a better place. Most important thing that happened yesterday is someone we all respect. Carl Icahn said, oops, I got it wrong. How many people out there feel like Mr. Icahn this morning? I think a lot of people miss SPX 4200. Question now, Lisa, did it get sucked in? Michael Hart of Bank of America this morning, what a quote. It would be so on brand for stocks to melt up into a recession, suck them all right in before the hard landing. <laughs> okay, <laughs> he's not wrong. Suck well, and here's the issue though, have they already been sucked in? And is it really, and Michael Hartnett was talking about this, has it already come in the tech sectors, particularly those tied to AI? I'm looking, for example, when you say, you know, where has the pain been? Perhaps the index level looks one way, but take a look at the KBW Regional Banking Index. It's down 26% year to date. Take a look at some of the consumer discretionaries down significantly. Right. This has <clears throat> not been a consistently range bound market under the surface, paddling duck is doing a lot of stuff. I'm just saying. Amy was Silverman. You've kept that all week. That's that's great. I mean, the whole, the whole what's going on underneath the surface. John, the drawdown. Let's look at the bigger picture here. From the peak in the nirvana of 2021, how far down are we? And the answer is we've come back a long way, but still we're beneath where we were. SPX, Dow, even the NASDAQ down 16 percent. You know, we got we got further to go to heal. You want some gains? NVIDIA up more than 100%. This year, year to date, Meta up 105% year to date. Is that because they changed the name? What a run. It was all about the name change, TK. <laughs> I think so. Nothing else. In the equity market on the S&P 500, we are just about positive on the S&P this morning, going into the weekend, looking for more gains potentially. Yields in the bond market, Look at just about unchanged. Down about a basis point. The 10-year, 363.45. If you want some more excitement, Tom, look to Europe. For all the talk that things are starting to unravel, for the long consensus trade European story as the data starts to shift the other way. DAX this morning, Bramo, record high. <laughs> yeah. So, I you know, basically know take all of those narratives and stuff them into the market and get a very unpredictable response. Today we're looking at the G7 talks, which are kicking off. President Biden is meeting with other leaders. They're gathering in Hiroshima, Japan. We've been getting some pictures of them all meeting as they head to dinner. Hopefully we'll get some messages, not only with respect to what's going on with the U.S. and the debt ceiling, but also just trade, supply chain resiliency, China, very much front and center. 8.30 a.m., Morgan Stanley's annual general meeting kicks off. Very curious to hear uh, the kind of pr pushback that they get to James Gorman serving as chair of the board as well as CEO. I know that that's one of the main issues. And today, the Fed speak, this is the big issue. No one cares about New York Fed President John Williams speaking at 8.45 a.m. No one cares about Fed Governor Michelle Bowman at 9 a.m. 11 a.m., Fed Chair Jay Powell and former chair Ben Bernanke in that discussion. This is a small matter. Let me take two seconds here, John, because sure. we've got an important guest. This panel's in honor of John Williams' great publishing colleague, Thomas Laubach, 
tragically dying of uh, cancer, and I believe it was at 55, mourned worldwide. He's a German economist with great Princeton cred, and to have Bernanke show up here uh, with Everyone else and Powell makes this a special conference. He was an advisor to Powell as well, I believe, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This is the guy, I mean, I think, I, I don't want to speak for John Williams of the New York Fed or Mike McKee, frankly, who knows this better than I do, but I'm going to suggest Lawbach led the charge on this thing we toss around our start. Very cool. Well, looking forward to the Fed speak through this morning. Eric Friedman joins us now, the CIO of U.S. Bank Asset Management. Eric, always wonderful to catch up with you, sir. Let's start here. Are we at risk of being sucked in to an equity market rally right before a big fall? Jonathan, we do think that there is a, a risk here of people really capitulating to the upside. And, and again, our viewpoint has been consistent with what you shared earlier in the in the, uh, the program here, that we think that the, the confluence of variables does work against both corporate profits as well as the consumer. We just haven't seen that happen in a material way yet. So our strategy has been, again, despite some of our concerns about both the uh, where ultimately Fed funds are going to settle out as well as how long they'll settle out, as well as the consumer, has been to shrink our tracking error. And, and we've done so, I think, somewhat uh, with with some some degree of, of what, let's call it debate amongst our team, but it's been the right decision to sort of shrink up that tracking error. So I, I do think that 4,200 has been the level. And if we see that level exceeded on good volume, you could see people say, look, let's just throw in the towel here and wait for a better uh, a better opportunity to uh, to be more negative. Eric, as you know, Level 1 CFA, you use John Deere as the accounting exercise. They're out with earnings. We're going to do the Deere earnings in a moment. All you need to know, folks, is their thumb up, up, up. And Eric Friedman, what I see here are corporations adapting to what they've been given, and most of them are delivering some form of surprise. Why does that end in the first quarter of this year? Why can't corporations keep delivering? Yeah, it's not, I think it's been, and you've done a great job of, of talking about both resilience and adaptability, and that's been the theme for the last really nine months uh, in, in light of all of the, the macro concerns out there. I do think that the, the issue that the consumer is going to face is the aggregation of higher interest rates as well as liquidity, which, which I know is a, is a topic that probably is undercovered, but you've got a couple of variables coming up. One, we think the Fed is going to keep uh, rates higher for longer. Two, when the debt ceiling, again, not that anyone has an edge on, on if and when the debt ceiling is resolved, when that occurs, the, the Treasury is going to come to market with, with more issuance. And when that happens, you're going to see more capital float away from the system. You also have China likely slowing down its liquidity injections. And finally, you have QT going on. So all of those variables do stack themselves up against this idea of persistent resilience, if you will. Uh, we just don't know when those things are going to all come and, 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 and basically confluence together. On the headline level, on the headline index level, it is perhaps resilience. Under the hood, it's either a bubble, if you trust Michael Hartnett over at Bank of America with respect to AI-related stocks and tech, or it's potentially a complete downdraft when you take a look at the regional banks. When you say investors are getting sucked back in right before it crashes, are we talking about tech going down? Yeah, Lisa, you know, I, I think that, that a crash scenario is probably unlikely. We think it'd be probably more of a, you know, melt up and then a, a gradual uh, migration lower. There is, of course, the risk that a lot of people are talking about now of, of what's called that Minsky moment, that credit event that, that occurs that people just don't see. So gap risk is certainly there. But, you know, I, I think that from a sector standpoint, technology is still bolstered by CapEx. That's something that we've been really actively monitoring. And to your point, the word count around AI has been, let's call it the tailwind for a lot of uh, a lot of broad tech spending. But, you know, ultimately, Lisa, I think that there's probably more of the consumer related stocks are going to be more vulnerable. Again, it's been tough to bet against those. Technology does have still that desire from CFOs to to get bigger, stronger, faster through investing in comm services. So that's probably not the area that we would bet against. We think that more likely the consumer side is the area that is a bit more vulnerable as we get deeper into this year. Is tech no longer than interest rate sensitive? Is it not necessarily going to sell off if the Fed holds rates higher for longer? You know, Lisa, we've been debating that, that 2020 playbook uh, scenario quite a bit. And I think that what you've seen in the last couple of weeks, especially as rates have gone higher, tech has done better. So I do think there's a level of decoupling between the, the idea that, that, look, you know, these are longer duration assets. And when we look at a discounted cash flow model, you have to have interest rates come down to justify cash flows being out maybe a little bit further in the uh, in the continuum than investors would like. So our viewpoint is that is that because the fundamental basis is still there. Again, to your point, there's been some 
let's call it uh, bubbly conversations about AI, and, <laughs> and that, that's something that, that markets have been responsive to. But until we see corporations really hold back on CapEx related to communication services and big data and cybersecurity, it's a tough area to really be, uh, you know, not investing in. So I do think there's some decoupling happening uh, with terms of rates and tech, but CapEx is probably the key variable to pay attention to as opposed to rates. Eric, we've got to leave it there. Great to start the morning with you and close out the week with Eric Friedman there of the U.S. Bank Asset Management. More earnings. Dear, here's the outlook from them. They lift their full year outlook for net income. Here's the range. $9.25 billion to $9.5 billion. They had previously seen 8.75 to 9.25. So, Tom, looking at that stock in the pre-market, we look pretty good, up by more than 3%. Across the board, outlook and guidance will be important because can they do the jump they're doing right now? And the jump condition is 3.8% up. Uh, make it 3.4% up on the stock. And, and I'm sorry, free cash flow turnaround, things look good. You wonder what the global is going to be um, as, as well. What's really important here is what do you do with deer to keep this going? And the answer is you got to mow Central Park's lawn. Oh, is that I got to right? do my part for Mayor Adams. What are you buying? This is the dream lawnmower, folks. When I was a kid, and this is Oak Hill, the PGA Championship this weekend, and this is what the adults use, and this is why John Deere's doing so well here. It's the 220 SL precision cut. This is a nice. little big. I think, you know, me on that rig, I think, is, you know, it's a little too much. How much does one of those set you back? That's got to be large. The basic one you push from behind that's a real mower with beautiful <laughs> cutting ability is about $3,200, which is a little more than the $80 one from Home Depot we were looking at the other day. I can see you with a cigar. You got Central that in a beverage. got to have the oh, beverage yeah, on. But, you know, there's some safety Who's features Who's going to drive there. it? <laughs> <laughs> There's a, what's great is you can get the dog sidecar like a motorcycle. Like nice. A fancy t- Very you cool. You can throw a vet bill right in there and you can be out there, you know, doing the lawn. Hey, look, the numbers look good. Good. The, phenomenal. The, the high end of the previous range is now the low end of the new range. Lisa, looking ahead for the year ahead. My favorite was the net income for the second quarter. $2.86 billion. The estimate, $194 million. Talk about <laughs> just great. that gap. Linda Deuce has going to weigh in on all of this. It's terrible. Federated right Hermes. On equities in about an hour from now. Looking forward to that conversation. Futures just about positive on the S&P 500. Interesting couple of days of gains that we can build on through this morning. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. President Biden is urging his negotiators to keep pursuing a debt limit deal. In a call from Japan, where he's attending the G7 summit, the president said he's confident that Congress will act in time and avoid a default. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy has indicated both sides may reach an agreement as soon as this weekend. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky will travel to Japan to join G7 leaders in person. Officials have added an extra session to the summit schedule on Sunday to accommodate his schedule. Over the past week, Zelensky visited European capitals asking for more weapons. The U.S. and Taiwan have agreed to increase their trade relationship. It's the first tangible result from an initi- initiative that faces strong opposition from China. The Taiwan initiative is in a for- formal trade agreement and doesn't address issues such as tariffs. Still, it clouds the outlook for a visit to the U.S. next week by a Chinese commerce official. Republican Senator Tim Scott reportedly will be airing TV ads in Iowa and New Hampshire next week. According to the Associated Press, Scott also plans an announcement on his potential run for president Monday in his hometown of North Charleston, South Carolina. Last month, Scott formed an exploratory committee allowing him to raise money while weighing a White House bid. Another development for Disney as the company engages in a high-profile fight with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. The world's largest entertainment company is dropping plans to relocate 2,000 California workers to a new corporate campus it was building in Florida. Disney's also closing a luxury hotel at its Orlando amusement park. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
Live from New York City this morning. Good morning to you all. Just getting some comments from the White House Press Secretary, Corinne Jean-Pierre. Comments on the debt ceiling negotiations. The president will get an update from the negotiating team a little bit later today. Here's an update on the Treasury cash balance, and it doesn't make for pretty reading right now. I've got to say, the cash balance has dropped to $68.3 billion yeah. as of May 17th. So this is the most recent data. That's down from $94.6 billion a day earlier. These numbers can be super volatile. So compare the latest to where we were a week ago. The latest is $68 billion, a touch higher than that. A week ago, $140 billion. Yeah. TK, the story's moving quickly, going into the so-called X state. To you, me, and the Everett Dirksen, that sounds like a lot of money. And I've been told by experts that is not a lot of money. And the trend here, even though you say it's volatile and it could pop up on a Monday when Abramowitz finally sends in her tax check, I mean, that could happen. But the answer is this trend lease is not good. I mean, this trend is just flat out not good. Which is the reason why it's hard to take the risk of an accident totally off the table. And I think that that's what some people have been saying. But Lisa, this speaks to why the president is cutting this trip short, right? There is a feeling that this, this has got to happen quickly. When Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen came out and talked about early June, maybe as early as June 1st, there was a feeling that there was a multi-week cushion in the mix, maybe a month-long cushion. I'm not sure people feel that Where comfortable are we right now on that? on that? I would where, agree with that. Where is that date right now? We June don't 1? really know. I think it actually feels like it might be early June, as opposed to early June with a one-month mm -hmm. cushion, that maybe the early middle of June might be where we need to make a deal. Okay. Right now, we're going to go to someone who knows the answer to these questions. She's working on it full-time from Japan. Amory Horton joins us, our Bloomberg Washington correspondent. Among the images, the remembrances at Hiroshima in a day at 6 p.m., make it 7 p.m., where G7 leaders, I assume, are meeting to greet and having dinner. Amory, what was the, the emotion at the memorial uh, to all that we have in Hiroshima? What was the emotion this morning? Well, obviously, it's a very emotional day. It's a, it's a powerful statement to have President Biden alongside these other G7 leaders go tour this grave site, the A-Dome, but also the museum, which for anyone who's been there is a very chilling effect. And, of course, then you have the Prime Minister of Japan really wanting to use this moment. This is his hometown, and he wants to talk about the future, and he wants to make sure that nuclear nonproliferation is on the agenda. Two things really come to mind for me. I have been to the Hiroshima, uh, Hiroshima Museum before, and I've been to it again recently on this trip. And what stands out to me now more than ever is at the very end, there's an exhibition about nuclear, atomic nuclear weapons around the world. And it ends on Medvedev and Obama in 2010 signing the New START Treaty. Well, what do we have here today? Yeah. Russia suspending the New START Treaty as of February. So you could see how far the world has come, but yet so much more we have to do. And then, of course, the symbolism mm -hmm. is going to become that much more important when Volodymyr Zelensky, Jenny Leonard and I reported overnight for you guys, Volodymyr Zelensky will be coming to the G7 summit in person to address world leaders at a time when Putin is using threats of atomic war and nuclear weapons as he continues to invade Ukraine. So that will be a key moment this weekend. And then Anne-Marie, a long trip home. I I'm sorry, Anne-Marie, getting out to Asia is easy. Getting home is always a challenge. Give us the immediacy of the debt study from Japan. Japan. Well, it's very immediate because the president will be cutting the dinner short this evening that he's attending with other G7 leaders to get on the phone with his negotiators. That is also how he started his day. Friday morning here in Japan, Thursday evening, Washington, D.C., on a call with his main team, the likes of Steve Reschetti, his OMB director, wanting to see where they are to make sure that there is progress moving into the weekend. The mood music is definitely positive. We had Speaker McCarthy coming out saying potentially there could be a deal taking shape by the weekend. You had Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer saying, I will recall back senators if there is this deal that we can vote on next week. So the progress is moving forward, but obviously we need to caveat this. Patrick McHenry, the chair of the Financial Services Committee, a key ally for McCarthy, says there's no deal just yet. There's going to be a lot of negotiations going into the 11th hour. That is why the president is cutting his trip short, and that is why he will be leaving Hiroshima directly to Washington, D.C. Sunday, e Sunday evening, because next week is really this feeling of do or die at the moment to make sure they can get this agreement over the finish line and then get it passed.
How much is President Biden coming under pressure from his own party, given the fact that he is open to some sort of work for welfare type of requirement that a lot of people in his party are getting really uh, upset about? I think the president really understands that it's a divided government and he has no choice. If he wants to lift the debt ceiling, he's going to have to negotiate Republicans, which is what he's doing. He said that he does not want to see those work requirements when it comes to, say, access to health care, but did it make the same sort of red lines for other social safety nets? And that like you say, Lisa, is going to be a key issue for some progressives. So what the president has to do at this moment, his, really his team of negotiators, is walk this fine line of making sure he is able to give in to some Republican demands to get a debt ceiling lifted, and the United States does not default. June 1st is becoming very close around the corner, and that is potentially a start of when we could see a U.S. default. But at the same time, he doesn't want to go back and redo what this administration hails as massive legislative wins over the past two years. You think of hard infrastructure, the CHIPS Act, and obviously most recently the Inflation Reduction Act. So this is the balance the White House is working right now and is why the president has brought Bruce Reed with him on this trip to Japan to make sure that he is constantly kept up to speed on the negotiations happening in Washington. AMH, these are serious issues, but you're at the G7, so I feel like I can throw this one in. Can you explain to our audience what a lick spittle is? What is a lick spittle? What is that? <laughs> So, Jonathan, I think you're better at uh, the <laughs> yeah, British good one. Good translations. One. But what I will say, what what I will say, I know what you're discussing right now. Uh, what Jonathan, if anyone has not read this story, there's a political story circulating in Europe about what the former uh, prime minister, Boris Johnson, was said to have said about Emmanuel Macron. And his comments about this individual are not very appropriate or polite for a morning television program. She's so time. experienced. Yeah. How professional is that? If this was, if this was, a, if this was Alex Steele and Guy Johnson, she would have gone right for How it. How professional was that? In the US that was morning. quality. AMH in Japan. Just, you know, keeping it right up there. Classy. I won't be. So this is what Politico's <laughs> got to say. Um, there's some words in here I'm not going to say out loud. Oh, thank you. According to an ex-aide, <clears throat> Boris said Macron was Putin's lick spittle and a something else. I mean, pretty brutal stuff. I wonder how awkward this might be if the, the British government meets with Macron this week in, in Japan, Tom. I, I think they're bouncing off everything. And, and, and there was a wonderful blurb. I'm going to give The Economist credit, but I really can't remember, where they said the United Kingdom and France, with all of their challenges, are now the special relationship versus the culture wars and oddities of the United States politics. And maybe that's true with these the new leadership that we have in the, the more, United Kingdom. The more I'm reading this story, I'm trying to get honestly, out of this in I'm, one piece, I'm dying. John. Lisa, help if you me read here. a lead paragraph that's ever sounded like this, a furious Boris Johnson once privately described Emmanuel Macron as Putin's lickspittle and promised to punch his light out, a key aide to the former UK Prime Minister claimed. What a story. Well, it's fascinating, especially because at this G7, Emmanuel Macron is going to be meeting with uh, Georgia Maloney, who he has a really contentious relationship, the Italian prime minister, and they're going to have a sideline meeting that people are really interested what that's going to be is like. Is he just trying to get hotel rooms in Venice? Well, <laughs> all, I know, all I know is, you know, how much does this color some of the discussions that are going on that also have perhaps a, a bit of, of hair on them? Colorful language, let's put it that way colourful language. Let's move on. I'm told we should move on. So we will move on. Priya Misra of TD Securities to on rates on. is coming up very shortly. In the equity market on the S&P 500, just about positive by 0.1%. There has been a lift in this market. Big two-day pop on the S&P 500. Tidy two-day rally on the S&P. Taking the S&P 500 to the highest levels of the year so far. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Almost the end of a long grind, getting you to the weekend with equity markets 
Poised for another morning of gains potentially on the S&P 500, up by 0.1%. On the Nasdaq, up by 0.1%. Also, the S&P 500 yesterday having a little look above 4,200 on the S&P yesterday at the close, just short of that level, but ultimately at the highs of the year. The bumpy road to nowhere is it starting to go somewhere. I tell you what, in the bond market, it feels that way. Yes. Two year, 10 year, 30 year, two year, every single day this week higher into Friday. So that's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Two years started the week, Tom, south of 4%. Right now, about 425. The collar trades is what I'm looking at. And so what you do is you go to the spread market where leases are articulate or I'd like triangulate foreign exchange. Euro yen is one of the things to look at removed from the dollar. And euro is compared to Japanese yen. Again, it's not bursting through a collar, bursting through the resistance at 150, but it's getting there. And it's been that four-day getting there. Let's talk about the FX market. On the euro <coughs> side, Tom, I'll let you talk Japan in just a moment. On the euro side of things, a break of 108 yesterday stays there just about, 107.97. Yeah, Before today, nervous. three days of dollar strength, euro weakness. So this currency pair <coughs> at a close yesterday, levels we haven't seen since March, actually, near the lows since March. And that euro weakness started to come through off the back of some weak <coughs> European data and resilient US data. On the Japan side of things, Tom, I know you want to talk about this. GDP, well, inflation, and a governor of the BOJ who wants nothing to do with the idea uh, of stepping back anytime soon. We can't waste time on this, folks. But this weekend, I promise, I'll read up on Japan. You read up on Japan as well. They got 7% nominal GDP. They got 4% inflation back to 1982. Think about that with the deflation they've had. So they've got a fictitious real growth based on a fictitious monetary policy of massive accommodation. What anybody would say, including Bernanke and Powell at the Lawbach Research Conference today, is not if it ain't broke, fix it. It is broke and it's going to get fixed. When? When is well? The when That's is the there? Question, isn't it? Huge risk here to the global system. The Governor Wade right now, Elisa. Uh, seemingly displaying very little interest in making a move anytime soon. Every note that I read about this seemed to confirm that they believe UADA. They're not going to make any kind of move, even though it does seem implausible and inflation has ticked up. But basically what they say is they're going to come out with a long-term study about how to move away from this. So basically, no risk that at the June meeting they're going to hike rates in any way or abandon the yield curve control. But six months from now, perhaps it's a different story. That's the BOJ speak. Let's talk about the Fed speak through today. Chairman Powell, really the headline event a little bit later on. Here's the quote from Priya Misra of TD. We see another 25 basis point <coughs> hike, then pause, then rate cuts. We expect the Fed to cut by year end and then cut a whole lot more, Tom, as the economy enters recession. Appropriate to speak to Ms. Misra now ahead of Global Rates, TD Securities, and we do this with the 210 spread, 60 basis points, her great call of curve inversion a good year and a half ago. Priya, good morning. You are focused not on 10-year, not on 2-year, but in the belly of the curve at 5 years. Why are you suggesting dynamics in the 5-year would be a more attractive place to be? Sure. So I think it's all about uh, how far you are from the first rate cut and where is the Fed going to cut those rates to? You know, I still think we're about six months away from the first rate cut. In fact, the risks are that they don't even cut this year. They start to cut next year. They're so hyper focused on inflation. They are looking for a slowdown. So I think they might be a little late. But once they start to cut, we think they're going to cut a lot more than what's priced in. I mean, the market's pricing in the uh, you know, what we're calling the uh, the trough rate, which is the end point of those cuts at 3%. I mean, 3% is actually higher than the Fed's estimate of neutral rate. So the market's not pricing in a recession, far from it. I think the market's pricing in normalization. If we actually do enter a recession, and in our view, it's going to be a recession, you know, because of the bank lending standards, because of the lagged impact of rate hikes as, as the consumer savings buffer runs out. And now we might even have fiscal drag. I think the only way to get a debt ceiling deal is to get that fiscal drag. So, you know, mm -hmm. as the economy slows down, I think the Fed's going to cut a lot more. But if the cuts are six months out, I think it's a little tricky to be in the very front end. But if you're too far out, then, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's essentially a right. lot of things that can move long end rates. I think that five year is sort of the sweet spot. Three year, five year rates, I think those are actually very attractive because they're positioning for the Fed whenever they start to cut, uh, just this idea that they're going to cut a lot. Post pause, whenever that is, where is the 10 year yield? So I would say the 10-year the is benefiting a little bit from the fact that there's significant inflows into bond mutual funds. You know, once the pause happens, I think we all look at what's next. I don't really buy the skip idea because the economy doesn't move, um, you know, it's, it's not that volatile. I think right now we're seeing the slowdown. 
as it starts to build up steam, I think it's going to lose momentum really fast. So I don't buy this skip and then re-hike. I think then we'll be all focused on when the rate cuts happen. I mean, we're we're looking at the 10-year below 3% by year end at, at 25 by next year. So the 10-year will also have a significant move. I just like the five-year a little bit more right now because it's more sensitive to economic data. We've been talking about the resilience in retailers. We've been talking about the resilience in deer sales. We've been talking about the fact that a lot of these companies have been able to pass along price increases, which is one reason why perhaps people are rethinking the view that you just put out there, that it's unlikely for the Fed to cut rates significantly in the next 12 to 24 months. Uh, Michael Hartman over at Bank of America said that the biggest pain trade in the next 12 months is a Fed funds rate rising to 6 percent instead of 3 percent. How realistic is that in your mind? So I can see this. So we're actually looking for one more hike. So we're looking for five and a half. You know, just listening to Fed speak, I think they would rather pause and stay on hold for longer than actually try and push the last. You know, what's 50 basis points among friends? I mean, they can go from five and a half to six. <laughs> Remember, they're also doing QT. So I think it's a high bar for them to keep going. But I think it's also a very high bar for them to start to cut. Because remember, they're looking for four and a half on the unemployment rate by year end. I think if we're at four and a half by year end, we're in a recession. The economy is slowing down pretty drastically. But the Fed might say, yes, this was in our forecast. So I think they stay on hold longer. But I, I would agree. I think if inflation uh, increases somewhere, I mean, the Fed's telling us that they want to slow things down. They don't see the slowdown. I think they're going to keep hiking. And as a result, they're going to overdo it. I think we're already in restrictive territory. It just takes a while for different parts of the economy to slow down. I mean, we're not getting that big shock that can slow down everything at the same time, which is why I think it's so tricky to trade this market. We moved 10, 20 basis points on not a whole lot of news. I think you just have to be nimble and sort of start to step in. We stepped in yesterday. We we're now a little bit long uh, duration here. We get another sell-off here. I think the technicals right now with all the FDIC sales, I think we should think about that as well. It's 100 billion that the FDIC is selling of fixed income paper. That's like new supply that's coming in. I think that's part of the reason why we've risen in, in rates. But you're supposed to start to think about hedging some of those risk assets. If the economy slows down, I think that's a pretty big pain trade as well. If the Fed does raise rates one more time, is that enough to break the backs of some of these regional banks that are drawing on some of the emergency lending facilities still to this day, even though the crisis, if it was one, has simmered off? So, I, you know, the, the deposit outflows have, have stabilized, but they're still continuing to leave banks. And I think that's going to continue to happen. It's very hard for banks to compete with deposits when money market funds are giving you, you know, 5%, 5 and a quarter. And if the Fed continues to raise rates, I think that gap continues to be wide. So I think the regional banks are still in trouble, not so much because of massive outflows, but their entire business model, if they're funding from the Fed at 5%, yeah. it's very hard to fund your assets, which you bought at 2%. So I think that's going to be a slow drag for the rest of this year and beyond. Priya, you are outrageous when you talk not only about inversion, but large inversion. You're also very lonely. Can you frame out, given the cards, and I, you know, let's assume optimistically we're going to get beyond the debt idiocy. Great. Can you frame out a 6% three-month T-bill? 6% LIBOR, SOFR, other short-term rates. No one's looking for that. All my radar's up. No, that's true. I think the, the big pain trade, really, another pain, pain trade is if inflation remains high. I mean, the tips market, it's the best indicator of market expectations of inflation. I think it's extremely mispriced. It's sub 2% in the near term. So I think the market's saying somehow magically inflation's going to come down, which is why the Fed will not raise rates. What if inflation becomes extremely sticky? That was the biggest aspect of our inversion call, was inflation is very slow moving, extremely lagging. And so if inflation actually stays high, there's your case for that 6% Fed funds. But does that move the five-year or the 10-year? In fact, the more the Fed raises rates, the more they'll have to cut. Because I have to think they take rates to you know, restrictive territory, then they keep it there for a while till things slow down. And that's going to mean that they're going to have to be a lot more accommodative when they start to cut rates. What's 50 basis points between friends? That's my takeaway from that conversation. What's 50 basis points it's between friends? Priya Mesra of TD. Priya, wonderful to catch she up with you. She could solve the debt crisis. Wait, you know, she could like do that. it single-handedly. What's, what's five trillion between <clears throat> friends? Can you imagine being at dinner and being like, you know, splitting, splitting the check? What's 50 basis points between eh, friends? 50 basis nothing. points, you know. What's 6% between friends? Dear <laughs> right now is up more than 6% at the moment. They're saying the right things this morning, lifting their outlook. 
The CEO, Chairman John May, saying this. Steer continues to benefit from favourable market conditions, Tom, in improving operating <clears throat> environment. I, it's just across the board optimism, and of course, it's a huge symbol of manufacturing American might. I really do wonder, I haven't seen it, maybe Lisa, you've seen it, what the dollar conversion is here to lift it up. They've had a little bit of a weak dollar. That's got to play into it. I got that question wrong on CFA level one, but, you know, maybe I'll try to get it right yeah, there this was a, weekend. There was a story about how it was many <clears throat> billions of dollars of either headwinds or tailwinds for companies, depending yeah. on where they were in the yeah. dollar, that that was one of the aspects. But even putting that aside... The fact that construction and forestry sales were up about 15 percent, just to give you a sense of just the scope of how much they've increased some of mm. their uh, of, of, of their profitability. Yeah. But here's the issue. How much is this because the, the price of food is going up? And frankly, a lot of the farmers are wanting to farm a lot more and are replacing their equipment and have the incentive to do so, even at higher rates, because the cost yeah, of food is I'll going go up. With that. I, I think there's a psychology on that. And Dignan and J.P. Morgan over the years has been fabulous on what Caterpillar does and Deer do. And there's always that, you know, to buy the new toy is is always out there but it's just such a symbol and i would say it plays into global wall street as well because in the cfa curricula you make or break your cfa level one test on deer accounting and equipment leasing i mean and it's you know. <laughs> break is the operative word there the stock is up nicely in the pre-market so this is the outlook for deer here's the outlook from namura and jordan rochester guys on china on the dollar this story starting to break just slowly, just really slowly starting to creep in. That big, big dollar short consensus call that you've heard so much yeah. of over the last few months, things starting to move the other way. Jordan Rochester yesterday publishing this. European and Chinese data surprises are in free fall. It points to weaker growth expectations and with it a stronger dollar in the near <clears> term. <throat> I saw a lot of that in my inbox yesterday, not just from Jordan, yeah. from Alan Ruskin at Deutsche Bank. Others too, Kit Duke Sokgen, talking can about it, the same thing. Can Aston Villa slow down Liverpool? That coming up next That's with Jordan thought, Rochester yeah. of Namora <laughs> on football and Aston Villa. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. White House negotiators say they are making steady progress toward reaching a debt limit deal. In a call from Japan, where President Biden is attending the Group of Seven Summit, Seven Summit, Biden told them he's confident Congress will act in time to avoid a default. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy has said both sides may reach an agreement as soon as this weekend. The G7 nations will agree to work together to track diamonds from Russia. But Bloomberg's learned they will stop short of slapping Moscow with an outright ban. Earlier attempts to sanction Russian gems in Europe have met resistance from importer nations like Belgium. Those countries argue that such moves would just shift the diamond trade elsewhere. President Xi Jinping says China is ready to help Central Asian nations bolster their security and defense capabilities. Xi was wrapping up a summit of the nation's leaders. His decision to assemble five former Soviet states without Russia's President Vladimir Putin demonstrated Beijing's senior position in the relationship with Moscow. The U.K. has laid out its strategy in the battle for dominance in the global semiconductor market. The government's committing $1.2 billion to bolster the British chip industry over the next decade. But that's far less than other countries. The Prime Minister Rishi, Rishi Sunak says that the U.K. will focus on where its strengths are, such as in research and design. And the U.S. tractor maker Deere has raised its full-year profit forecast. The company sees rising earnings thanks to strong demand for farm equipment and the easing supply of chain, supply chain problems. Deere is a bellwether for the health of the agricultural industry. It's the world's largest producer of farm machinery. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lise Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. History shows that monetary policy works with long and variable lags, and that a year is not a long, long enough period for demand to feel the full effects of higher interest rates. 
That's Philip Jefferson, the Fed governor and presumed future Fed vice chair as well. I have to tell you, that didn't really make the headlines yesterday. This did from President Logan of the Dallas Fed, who said this. The data in the coming weeks could yet show that it is appropriate to skip a meeting. As of today, though, we aren't there yet. That's the call from President Logan going into the <coughs> mid-June meeting and maybe leaving the door wide open for another rate hike by this Federal Reserve. And we'll find out if Chairman Powell is willing to walk right the way through it a little bit later this morning when he speaks at 11 a.m. Eastern time. I'm just distracted by a bit of news coming from Axios, and I think this really meets the tone that we were kind of given a little bit earlier in the programme. Axios saying that Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has warned the country's biggest bankers that a potential debt ceiling default will have repercussions beyond the financial system and insisted, here's the important piece, that the early June X date is real. Now, this is something we keep going back to. <clears throat> yeah. When Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen came out and said early June, maybe as early as June 1st, there's always a feeling that as a policymaker, the prudent thing to do is be conservative and have a one-month cushion, maybe even longer than that. There's just a feeling based on the cash balance of the Treasury over the last week, Tom, that perhaps that early June date is more real than we thought it was maybe a few weeks ago. The only way to understand this is to go into Treasury next to the White House and you stand there, and I've done this with, with our radio shows over the years, in the cash room. And there, there's an ornate 19th century, John, I'm sure there's an equivalency in London, of where cash actually moved for the United States of America. And we're all, including our vaunted politicians on both sides, removed from the cashiness of society. The Secretary of Treasury, whoever the president is, doesn't have that luxury. This is getting real, Lisa. Just slowly. Just slowly. Well, perhaps this is the reason why we're hearing real talk <clears throat> out of the likes of uh, Kevin McCarthy and President Biden saying there actually is something that needs to get done next week. And that's what uh, Anne Marie was talking about. Yeah. It needs to get done. Perhaps that's the drop dead date because this is a real deadline. That's the deadline. <clears throat> for the dead talks, and we're going to hear more on that through the next hour or so. This is what we're hearing a lot of from the south side at the moment. Just maybe, maybe this view on Europe, China, the rest of the world is starting to break. Jordan <coughs> Rochester of Nomura wrote this. European and Chinese data surprises are in free fall. ZEWs, IP, factory orders, retail sales have really pushed the Eurozone data surprises to big lows. It points to weaker growth expectations and with it, a stronger dollar in the near term taking a look at a euro dollar over the past 10 days or so this is what we look like a break of 108 107.93 this is a big change tom from the 110 pushing 111 from a few weeks ago joining us on jordan rochester of nomura jordan we could do a one-hour conversation here we don't have time for that i'm going to go at rapid speed john and lisa are going to jump in as well what is the significance of renminbi out past seven once again we visit through seven it's been ages since it's seven yuan per dollar what is the symbolism of 7.01 yuan cny well, for market psychology, it's a big deal. But for us, we think that actually maybe the sort of 725 to 730 level is where the PBOC will be more uncomfortable. We have had a statement, of course, today saying that they want to reduce speculation in the currency market. We've seen that sort of statement before, but that's kind of why we've seen CNH rally a little bit today. But for us, the, the momentum in the Chinese economy has changed quite significantly from what we hoped it would be what the market hoped it would be just a few weeks ago. And that has been really driving the, the renminbi underperformance. But it's also the, the U.S. side of things as well. We've had more hawkish statements from some of the regional Fed governors. John actually flagged a few of them, from Logan yesterday, for example, and Mester. And that's helped the Fed pricing adjust as well. So we have less rate cuts priced for the Fed this year, too. Combine that together, we're looking for 730 in dollar CNH by middle of July. That's quite a quick move in the grand scheme of things. We've been kind of been in a low volatility environment. A lot of people had actually got quite bored at putting on sort of CNH risk and we're looking at other proxies for it in the G10 or an EM. It wasn't really the scenario for us. Uh, we think that actually it's going to have a big move to come. Jordan, a lot of people now starting to think about maybe going the other way in the FX market, leaning into some dollar strength after that big consensus view built up over the last few months off the back of what's happened with the data, just subtle shifts that you've identified. Jordan, can you identify the best way to play that through G10 at the moment? Yeah, absolutely, John. And the one thing this market keeps reminding us is you can't lean back. You can't say, I've got this long-term, medium view of euro upside, which we do, and relax. You can't just crack out the popcorn, get the nachos, and watch the film. You have to be active and, and respond to events. And what's happened here is the data in Europe has really underwhelmed. I, I thought at first we could ignore it, John. I thought the factory order is falling lower. That's something that maybe could be corrected in the next month. But what we've actually started to see is the more forward-looking signals, such as the ZEWs, those sort of centics index in Europe, 
they've also been turning lower as well. So the momentum's gone. We're not short euro dollar. For us, we, we think the better trade is short cable. Uh, so why is that? It's because, first of all, next week we've got UK CPI, and we think there's going to be a big drop in that number. We could actually go below 8%. We're, we've been above 10% for roughly around seven months or so in the UK. It's been quite painful for the consumer, 10% double-digit inflation. Hopefully next week we get that sign that the Bank of England has done enough and we get that below 8%, 7.9% our team's looking for. If we get that, John, the pricing for the Bank of England, which is around about 45 basis points for the next two meetings or so, that might head lower. We think there's just one more rate hike to come. So it should be more towards 25 basis points to 30 basis points. Jordan, I love how you describe people getting bored as they put on one trade for too long and then just switch it over to something else. It sounds like basically a junior high school version version of uh, version of uh, macro trading. I'm just wondering from your perspective whether this is basically going to be the most painful chop. Swipe down, John. <laughs> the most painful chop that you can possibly imagine just because it is so tough to stick with any one trade for a considerable period of time. I think it's quite like 2021, which was a really difficult year for us. I remember it quite well. 2020, we had the vaccines invented, the euro rallied, we got to 123, dollar weakness. Then we got to the beginning of January, and Joe Biden's Democrats, they won those Senate seats in Georgia, and we had a 3% swing higher in the dollar. It caught us off guard. It caught a lot of people off guard. The market was pretty much overly positioned for dollar weakness at the time. I think that's kind of where we got to. Most client meetings, not recently, but about two weeks ago, it was, we agree, we think euro goes higher, we think the pound goes higher, we think the yen goes higher. That's now changed quite substantially with these the data surprises and market moves. And I think it's a lot more uncertain out there. It's going to be a bit more like 2021, I think, where for nine months of that year, we had a zigzag in the dollar. So the dollar went up for the first three months, then it went down for the next three months, then it went up again in the, three months after that. It was only in uh, Q4 2021 when we got a pure sense that the gas supplies that uh, Vladimir Putin was essentially restricting before he invaded Ukraine really added to that dollar uh, strength. And also we had the inflation spike in the US at the time as well. So we're kind of in that sort of mean reversion place in the G10FX. And that's the tricky part for this year so far. Jordan, is that why you're only willing to make a short term tactical call right now with regards to this strong dollar? John, to be tactical is important. You have to make money here and now. So yes, we always have our eye on the next one month horizon. And then after that, we think about the long term. The long term is, I think euro does head higher again, John. The terms of trade are fantastically moving in euro's favor. It suggests euro should be 115 to 120. So medium term, I haven't turned massively bearish on the euro. But in the very short term, I look at those Fed cuts that are priced in, John, roughly around 45 basis points yeah. now, let's say. I think that should be more towards 25. And then perhaps the market might start to fade that. You know, my question, John, is if you're with Aston Villa and you're sitting in the cop at Liverpool, yeah. I mean, medium term really doesn't matter. I'd suggest that if you were an Aston Villa fan that you don't sit in the cop end. Jordan, you're not doing that, are you? Maybe not. I can't Maybe confirm. Yes. You think you're in a villa shirt? I'm not sure what pillow tie I'll be wearing. <laughs> I think they'll be kicking him back out. This is fun. I mean, Aston Villa wasn't supposed to be fun this year, and it is. Like now they're playing really well. It's fun. Jordan, you must be happy. It's fantastic. I mean, we were fighting relegation not long ago. So this is just to be in the top end of the table and actually look at, you know, five, six, seven, eight and think maybe we've got a chance of being there is fantastic. I've got to talk to Tom about championship playoff finals in the next week or so, Jordan. So wish me luck. Jordan Rochester of Namura. Got to explain to you who Coventry City are, Tom, the Sky Blues. I noticed that the Looking Sky Blues are doing promotion. well. They're doing better than Queen Park's Rangers. There you go. Noticed. QPR. Did I do okay on Muhammad's QPR? team. Nice. Did that I was do perfect. That okay? Lisa, help me with that. <laughs> <clears throat> Coventry City looking at a promotion, folks, TK. Folks, full disclosure big, big here. News, I'm, I'm like big clueless news. on this, okay? Well, I'm just doing this because Pharaoh makes me do it. You know, we have tantrums. We have a domestic. A domestic? Yeah, if I don't play, keep up. Young Pharaoh was football. once on trial at Coventry City as a lad. That didn't it's work out, exciting. which is why I'm here. Now, seriously, <laughs> if they win, the, if they win choice? the league that they're in, does Coventry City go up? So the this is the playoffs. League? They're in the playoffs. Someone else won the league. This is the playoffs, the final spot to get promotion to the Premier League. Big money. They could be in the Premier League. They That's could be. really they cool. They could be back in the Premier it's League. It's so much better than Very America. Cool. And then I'll take you to Cough, Tom. And we'll Kansas City Royals are going to get. Be Kansas great. City Royals are going to get relegated. Who would come up? Rochester Red Wings. Nice. Is that a real team? Luke Easter, Boom Powell. <laughs> I've got no idea. Your equity market positive now, 0.1% on the S&P 500. Linda Dussel of Hermes on equities joining us next.
we should see some progress on inflation in the coming months. If you think the U.S. has an inflation <coughs> problem, Europe has a much bigger one. Real purchasing power has declined over the course of the last 24 months. There's going to be a realization here that the economy is not collapsing. The markets haven't done anything. So no one is right. No one is wrong. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. Nine months highs in the equity market. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market just about positive on the S&P after closing yesterday at the highest since August 25th, the day before Chairman Powell warned of pain in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Tom, on August 26th. Well, that's where we've been. And it's in a collar, and we're up at the top of the collar looking at SPX. The VIX yesterday got down to 16.02. And the answer is, can you say breakout? Absolutely not. Technically, there's no way you can say we reach beyond to some new territory. But nevertheless, on a Friday, the bears are looking at the ceiling going, okay, what do I write about for Monday morning? Missed it. Missed it. No, I, I'm not going to be that harsh. Carl Icahn, I thought was great. He came out, he said it's cost him $9 billion, but he's playing a different game. The strategist on Wall Street, you can remain intact, neutral, intact, bear, because we really haven't broken out with enthusiasm. Adam Johnson. Remember Adam? You sit yeah. on this table. Yeah, Adam's great. fantastic. Yeah. Adam on the equity market over at Bullseye. He said, if you see a bear, hug him. They need it. Yeah. That's what he said, which just sounds brutal. But if he you really think it. about if you really think about the range of the year so far, thirty eight hundred at the low end, forty two hundred at the yeah. high end. We had a sneak peek <clears> above forty two hundred yesterday, Lisa, forty one ninety eight at the close. I'm gonna defend the bears a little bit because that's of course. my role. I, I will just say this is the year the Whoa, index trading you breathe the glow. The the index trading uh, trade has died. And I will say that when we talk about the index being range bound, I do think that that really goes against what some of the trades have been under the surface, which have been relatively violent. You talk about NVIDIA and a 100 percent gain. Take a look at Microsoft. Take a look at Google. Take a look at Amazon. All of these trades that are actually getting a lot of steam based on AI, based right. on tech, based on capital expenditures. So at a certain point, is this really right. a market going nowhere or just a market that's splintering under the surface? Beautifully framed and what's not being spoken about is not NVIDIA or even what Apple's doing. Uh, 191, I think, is a $3 trillion company. It's that the gloom of the SPX bear market has made it halfway back. I mean, nobody's talking about, you know what? It was pretty ugly, pandemic and all that, and we've made it halfway back. Even the, the bears, I don't think they even want to give credit to that moment. We spent a lot of time talking about and months talking about this, revisiting the lows of October. Spend a yep. lot of time, and then the grind just continues. Now, you get to this kind of point, and I always find markets really, really interesting from the psychological aspect of it. And this is what Michael Hartner is talking about this morning with this quote here. It would be so on brand for stocks to melt up into recession. You suck them all in right before the hard landing. That's quite a powerful quote, because I think that resonates with a lot of people listening to this right now, Lisa. They weren't in those names that you've talked about. They haven't been riding high in the equity market off the lows of October. They're sitting here, and they're wondering, ah, should I get in? Well, but even Eric Friedman earlier in the show, he was talking about how he's generally pretty pessimistic. Can you get short big tech? Eh, kind of tough. Take a look at capital expenditure. It's still happening. So even the well, people who are seeing some clouds of the horizon aren't sure that this is still the interest rate sensitive kind of bet that's as vulnerable as it has been in the past. We're going to talk, John, to a wonderful guest on fundamental analysis. But I thought a real moment yesterday was Jim Bianco. CMT, very good at technical analysis, disagreeing with one of his and mine heroes, Ralph Ancampora. Ancampora saying October, bear market low. Bianco's not there, and that's a debate into the weekend, technically. Tony Dwyer summed it up brilliantly this week, didn't he? Yes, that was a great <laughs> note. Too anxious to get short, too nervous to get long, and kind of stuck somewhere in between right now, Tom. He has like four kids in New Hampshire in summer camp. It, it, that's going to cost saint. you. He's he's a freaking saint. That's going to make you anxious. He's just I, I his note was on fire yesterday. He has to good. write those notes to pay for summer camp. Very cool. Let's get to the price action. Equities look like this. Just about positive by 0.2 percent on the S and P in the bond market. Lisa, yeah, it was just turning higher just a moment ago. 365 on a 10 year. And people pricing out some of those uh, rate cuts that they had priced in earlier this year. Today we do have those G7 talks taking place. Very curious to hear what they have to say about China. We are going to also be hearing about what President Biden 
Biden's update that he gets from Washington, D.C. on the debt ceiling will be later today, 8.30 a.m., Morgan, Staniel's, uh, Morgan Stanley's annual general meeting. Interesting to see whether there are any comments about what to expect out of lending, lending standards, regional banks, what the read-through is to their business. And today, Fed speak includes New York Fed President John Williams at 8.45 a.m., Fed Governor uh, Michelle Bowen at 9 a.m., and the main event, 11 a.m., Fed Chair Jay Powell and the former uh, Fed Chair Ben Bernanke in this conversation. Does he endorse what we've been hearing and the splintering views? Where does he weigh in in terms of where the balance of risks lies? Tough call, isn't it? Because you're going into a June meeting, you've got no idea what the debt ceiling scenario looks like. Oh. Latest reporting coming out of Japan, Anne-Marie leading the effort here at Bloomberg, is that the president will leave a G7 dinner early. According to the press secretary, the plan is for him to get an update from his negotiating team. The latest from Axios suggesting that that early June date, Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, is pushing the story, Tom, well, that that is very real. This is different than how President Trump would handle it, but with great respect for all, this president has miles of legislative experience. And it's a symbolism, John. I don't know what he's going to do after the dinner. Maybe he's going to watch, you know, you know, you know, watch the golf. Or, or sure. watch some golf, watch the PGA Championship. But it's the symbolism that he's leaving a G7 dinner to get briefed on what's going. It, it's it's the theater clearly, of it as well. They clearly want us to understand that. Yeah, clearly. Yeah, yeah. they it's, want us to be. Talking they want about the Republicans to early. understand that. He might be abroad, but he's going to leave a dinner early and prioritize domestic yeah. issues. You know, there's always a spin there when you get these oh, kind of stories, th th always. Yeah, let's remember, he was two years old when Hiroshima happened. I mean, this is the last of our World War II presidents, and the theater is part of it. I believe we'll catch up with AMH yeah. a little bit later this hour. Looking forward to doing so. Joining us now is Linda Dussel, the Senior Vice President and Senior Equity Strategist at Federated Hermes. Linda, let's start with this one. Easy question. Are you too nervous to get long or too anxious to get short? <laughs> Good morning to you. Uh, we at Federated Hermes have been sticking with the wide range that you just referenced, uh, 3,800 to 4,200, and we're there right now. So uh, we think that you know, on the high end, you trim, and on the low end, you find bargains to buy. And what are the bargains these days? Well, what are the bargains, Linda? I mean, I, I'm sorry, you caught me there mid awares I thought you were going to give me three names so I can get through the weekend. What does, oh, sure. John, <laughs> what does John Deere, is an iconic federated holding, what does John Deere symbolize with that buildup of free cash flow and the ability to adapt to very good numbers? Yeah, well, the, the recession that everybody's been waiting for isn't coming, hasn't come. And, of course, it's a big name that, that uh, would reference that. Where are the bargains now? are in the small cap stocks. And, you know, you were talking just, just before I came on about how strong the stock market is. Truly, it is, as we all know, it is a very, very narrow advance in the stock market. If you look in the United States, in the last seven weeks, we've been trading in an extremely tight range, not even a 2% range in the last six weeks. Now, the pain trade is obviously up, and we're all looking at this, and we're all saying, I know it's 4,200. I know that's the high end of the range. It's been driven by a handful of stocks. The breadth has been extremely weak, the weakest it's been in 45 years. What, am, what does that mean I'm supposed to do? History says it is not clear. Nothing is particularly clear. And just for the first time today, I'm reading the word malaise. We said that word a lot back in the 70s and the early 1980s. What do you do? You clip coupons. And if you have a really long-term view, small caps have been absolutely crushed. Do you think, Linda, that there is a trade in big tech that you can either get long or get short, or do you avoid because it's been so volatile and it's been, frankly, the focus of this narrow breath? Uh, yes, it is, but, it, but it, the, the, the tech trade has been in the largest cap techs. The equal weighted is still not you know, particularly overbought. Technology is fantastic, but also, as we know, these biggest names are driven by the excitement for AI. It's kind of more on the come, so that's kind of already in the stocks. But I saw very interesting <clears throat> statistics, and it's been a few months now, quite a few months probably now, that says this breadth that we talk about that's so very, very narrow. Well, guess what? These huge companies have the cash flow that make that des it deserves the percentage of the market cap that what they are in the S&P 500. They are strong and extremely strong versus the rest of the market, but the rest of the market has gone nowhere. So you can look for it. It's, it's just a, an ideal stock picking environment. 
You can find other ideas beyond the top seven names, which have just moved the entire market this year to date. This has been a market. Uh, and, this has been a market that's been trained by years of financial repression and the macro trade, not necessarily individual stock picking. So, at your point, do you feel like people will all flood in at the wrong point rather than just going toward the stock picking trade and say maybe we were wrong, maybe the index can get to 4,600 by year end? Well, it definitely can do, and we're say, we're saying that it can do that. But uh, you know, in terms of uh, of what people are doing and what are they holding back, and I mean, one of the the question that I get uh, most asked us, excuse me, asked most often as I travel is, what can I buy? There's so much dry powder. People are so tired of waiting. Please give me my recession, please. I think is what uh, Steve Auth has, my my uh, my boss, Steve Auth has Love been Steve. putting out there. Please, can I please have a, a recession now? No, you can't have a recession yet. And what people are not talking about, in my opinion, enough, is that there's still $1 trillion of excess monies out there in our consumer hands looking to be spent. That's why we need to be patient, whether we're bullish or bearish. We need to spend that money down, and that will include buying you know, just small dips in the stock market. Uh, so it, you, know, you really have to do your homework. Send our best to Steve, won't you, Linda? Big fan Pardon of Steve Orr. Send our best to Steve. Linda does all there of Federated Hermes. And we're sending our best to you, Linda. Thank you. What do you make of AI and all this chat that AI might be in a bubble already, Bramo? You like know, five months into the rally. I want to understand where people are actually using it. I don't buy that it's going to be something that totally intermediates everyone's jobs. But which are the companies that can strip out the greatest number of workers or, or, or bolster how much people can be productive in their positions? I want to understand more of that and less of AI is going to cure the world. Yay, jump, you know? And I think that there's a little bit of that that gets or, me a little concerned. Or end the world. Well, then there's also the Armageddon, you know, it's going to take but over. Armageddon's and an easy trade, you know. If you believe that <laughs> it is, Armageddon's I know it's, the easiest trade in the world. You're talking to me. Max Long. <laughs> Nothing to lose. It makes 100%. You're going with it. So if you believe AI is going to go to the end of the world, guess what? Is the, Max Long. Is the, it's like the easiest trade out there. Sometimes is, it's so bad, it's so good. Stuffing cereal in your mouth the whole way down. There's only upside, right? The world's going to end. I guess so. Maybe it won't. Yeah. Great. Max Long. 100%. The toxic brew trade. <laughs> yeah. No. I want to come back. When we come back, John, I want to talk about something Linda Dussel said there. She was on fire. Very cool. We'll do that. Really good. David really Bailin good. in the next hour. Look out for that from City on Stocks. Equities right now in the stock market, just about positive on the S&P from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. President Biden is urging his negotiators to keep pursuing in a debt limit deal. In a call from Japan, where he's attending the G7 summit, the president said he's confident that Congress will act in time and avoid a default. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy has indicated both sides may reach an agreement as soon as this weekend. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky will travel to Japan to join G7 leaders in person. Officials have added an extra session to the summit's schedule on Sunday to accommodate his schedule. Over this past week, Zelensky visited European capitals asking for more weapons. Republican Senator Tim Scott reportedly will begin airing TV ads in Iowa and New Hampshire next week. According to the Associated Press, Scott also plans an announcement on his potential run for president Monday in his hometown of North Charleston, South Carolina. Last month, Scott formed an exploratory committee, allowing him to raise money while weighing a White House bid. Shares of Foot Locker are plunging. The sports shoe retailer cut its full year sales outlook and reported first quarter sales fell more than 9 percent. Foot Locker also said that merchandise inventories were 25 percent higher than at the end of the first quarter last year. And the U.S. tractor maker Deere has raised its full year profit forecast. The company sees rising earnings thanks to strong demand for farm equipment and the easing supply chain problems. Deere is a bellwether for the health of the agricultural industry. It's the world's largest producer of farm machinery. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
there's two types of people when you talk about the debt de uh, debate. There's those, uh, to put it in Bloomberg terms, that Anne-Marie Horton would interview that would tell you there's a 40 or 50 percent chance that we're going to default. And then there's the Wall Street types that will tell you that there's a 3 or 4 percent chance that we're going to default. And I'm probably in the 3 or 4 percent chance that we're actually going to see a default. We're going to see a lot of political theater. Tons of political theater. Jim Bianco there, the president of Bianco Research on the latest debt ceiling negotiations. I can't give you the odds. I'll just give you the latest reporting from Anne-Marie, who we'll speak to in just a moment, that the president will leave a G7 dinner early, according to the press secretary. The plan is for him to get an update from his negotiating team. There is a feeling that maybe we might have a framework for an agreement, perhaps as soon as late this weekend, Tom. I can only also offer you the numbers. We did that last hour. It's worth doing it again if you are just tuning in. Welcome to the programme. This is the Treasury cash balance. It's dropped to $68.3 yeah. billion as of May 17th. This can be a really volatile number day to day. So if you do it week on week, that $68 billion number down from 140 last I, week. I totally agree with you. That is the zeitgeist into the weekend. To me, that's a key number, and that's going to be the, the at the staff level. They're going to go, do you guys realize what the vector is on this? What do they do when they break $50 billion? I don't know. And they've got to come but, to an agreement, Tom, not just the staff yeah. level. They've got to then do that at the higher level, and then they've got to get it through Congress. There's still a lot of work in the process to be done here. There, there is, and the work's going to happen over this weekend. I think this is going to—I'm more optimistic about this. I think the d discussion and the, co the come-to-Jesus moment, if you will, is going to happen a lot sooner rather than later. I'd go this weekend. Distracted by all this, in Japan, Anne-Marie Horton joins us, our, our uh, Bloomberg Washington correspondent with President Biden at the G7 meetings. Anne-Marie, I want to get one Pacific question in before we get back to the specifics of the debt battle. And that is, Joe Biden was two years old, as Peter Baker told us this morning, when this bombing happened in Japan. It was an exhausted America, an exhausted force coming up from Australia, where MacArthur was. We will not visit Australia. Going through with immense heroism, 200,000 allies dying in Papua New Guinea. He's not going to visit there as well. But there's a new America in the Pacific. What is it? What is our American exceptionalism right now as we reacquaint ourselves with the Pacific? Well, this is what's so difficult about this trip, right? And this got to the heart of my conversation with Admiral John Kirby yesterday, who he said the president can reschedule a trip to Australia. The president can reschedule a trip to Papua New Guinea. He cannot reschedule a potential default. And that is something that is a concern for all of these world leaders, G7 or not. But what they have, what he has said to me as well is that what they've seen is extensive months and years of work with the United yeah. States really putting a bigger emphasis on their work in the Pacific Rim. And that's what you actually see here on the G7. Yes, of course, the debt ceiling is looming large on the president. It is changing his plans. Many critics are saying the dysfunction in Washington is undermining this administration's foreign policy goals. But the administration says that's just uh, really right. too easy of a narrative and just not true. The president is still going to have those important conversations, including the Quad, on the sidelines here of the G7. And, John, this goes to John Kirby's interview with Emory Horter yesterday, where at the Admiral Kirby was clearly frustrated and how the debt debate, which is tangible, has taken over this meeting. His language, he didn't yeah. want the U.S. to become a so-called deadbeat nation yeah. and not pay its bills. Yeah. Pretty emphatic stuff. AMH, I'm just looking at this Axios reporting that Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has been telling people publicly, privately, that this early June X date is real. AMH, do you get the sense that it is real? based on your reporting at the moment? Because initially when we got that date, there was a feeling there was about a one-month cushion, maybe even longer than that. How real is that X date? Well, when we first got that, she said as early as June 1st. But I even got the sense from her when I sat down with her in Nagata that there is an immense amount of concern within Treasury. They want to see Congress act. She didn't even want to discuss the potential contingency plans if there were to be a default on which payments the United States could prioritize. So this is something that is not just looming large on the president here at the G7, clearly looming large on her and the Treasury because she has not changed that posture. It is as early as June 1st. And what you hear in terms of the political rhetoric right now is that they are rushing to get this deal done by the end of May. So I think that speaks volume to the concern that 
really as early as June 1st is pretty serious. That first week could potentially be when the U.S. could suffer a default if they do not have a deal and if they do not lift the debt ceiling. Does this backdrop, Anne-Marie, uh, weaken President Biden's negotiating power at the G7 when it comes to things like supply chain resiliency and coming uh, together on some sort of China plan? Well, I think the president wants to come here with a big message to his partners that he wants to make sure everyone is aligned when it comes to dealing with China. What you constantly hear now from officials uh, within especially the European Union, within the United States, is they don't want to decouple, they want to deem risk. This seems to be the language all leaders are coalescing around, but it was an important message the president had to bring, especially on the heels of Emmanuel Macron's trip to China, the interview he gave back, talking about strategic autonomy. The United States wants to see the G7 speaking with one voice when it comes to China. But now the president is coming here and he has to answer questions about concerns from all these world leaders on whether or not the United States is going to default because they know as much as the White House knows the damage that would do to the global economy. So in that respect, it does create um, a little bit of a wrinkle, to say the least, for the president as having these negotiations, shoring up all of his allies to combat China and have tougher language on China, especially when it comes to economic co coercion, but at the same time also making sure to say, say to them to assuage their concerns that the U.S. will not become the latest risk and issue for the global financial system. AMH, great to catch up with you. Appreciate it, as always. And Marie on the latest at a G7 over in Japan. Just tremendous reporting from her, as always. Just want to bring you the latest in the market. We had some numbers from Deer a little bit earlier this morning. They've raised their outlook. That stock is higher. Was as much as 6%. Now it's about 3.6%. That's the latest from them. I have to say, Lisa, I know you're probably going to look at this in a few moments, but worth bringing up now. Foot Lock are not exactly doing the same thing this morning, and that's hurting others. Well, and this is sort of the issue of the zombie roll-up that Tom talks about. How many of the companies that have really struggled with their footprints, with their brands, are continuing to struggle while others gain? Are you seeing, basically, the winners take all at a time when the losers really lose market share? Foot Locker has really struggled, so let's just be honest. So this is coming after already weakening. I mean, how, what, have you ever gone into Foot Locker? Ever? Not for a long time. Right. Not for a long time. Used to. Used to. But now, direct consumer from the likes of Nike is so good. Yeah. Why would you go to Foot Locker when I can just go straight to should Nike I, and get it delivered? Should I get the Air Jordan high cuts or low cuts? What do you think? Uh, I don't know which ones are going to work for you, Tom. I don't, you know. What would you prefer? Email in, folks. I, this is a raging debate at home. I'm more of a low cut kind of guy. I've never really been. But, but they're not, they're know, fake. Like, the they're like high tops. Tops. High tops are cooler, tops. though, right now. What I'm, Michael, I'm not cool anymore, <laughs> Brett. Well, can I can see you with a low me top. walking around with heights. No, no, it wouldn't. It wouldn't Come work. On. No, because you that want the subtle. Work. You want the what's it called? Quiet, quiet. Stealth wealth. Stealth wealth. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Not for me. Yeah. That's just a suggestion for others. Stealth wealth is a good thing. A great <laughs> no brands. <laughs> great no so, brands. Not for you. Yeah. You're not into stealth no, wealth. No, I'm just. These are just recommendations for the, for the general public. For the general public. Are, are That's a PSA. The, can I ask you a question seriously about this whole fashion thing and Bloomberg Intelligence? Andrea Felsa and others have really been good on this on the luxury thing. Do posh people do stealth wealth in the United Kingdom? <laughs> oh, you mean this? like proper posh people? Proper posh people. Like the do upper they class. Do no, they do hand-me-downs. <laughs> they do hand-me-downs. So it's like your wax from... jacket from your great-great-grandfather. They don't buy clothes. Oh, okay. No. I'm no. learning every day. You know, I went to school with people, most of whom had no money, and when I was growing up, and everyone dressed, dressed up real, real nice, and the people with money didn't. And... One of my friends, I once asked about this divergence, and uh, he said, I can't afford to dress like that because of the way that I'll be Well, treated. the posh kids also, they have really bad fashion sense. Do you know why? Because they go to those <laughs> schools. They go to those schools, they're told what to wear, and then they have their, their church uniform for a Sunday. And it's a uniform. It's life. They have a uniform for everything they go to. And that's it. And it's just a bunch of hand-me-downs. That's what the posh people do, which is why they're all sort of like uptight in that tweed in Why the winter. Are you at me? And they don't go to you know, Foot Locker, which is really where we began. They certainly don't go to Foot Locker. <laughs> there you go. They don't know what Foot Locker is. <laughs> From New York, this is Bloomberg. All of a sudden this week, this market got a little bit more interesting. It was getting boring, really boring. Now we're at the very high end of the trading range for the year. Nine-month highs on the S&P 500. Back to the levels we last saw 
when Chairman Powell was in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, talking up pain on the S&P 500. That morning, we opened 41.98 on the S&P. Yesterday, we closed at 41.98. Jens Nordvig of Exante Data, good friend of this program, just wrote in, sometimes the stability is blurred by the vol. It's been a bumpy road to nowhere, let me tell you that. The lows of late last year, talking about threatening to go back to those lows and then this slow grind higher at the index level. And beyond the index level, Lisa's talked a lot about this. Beneath it, some big, big moves we can discuss in a moment. In a bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, two-year higher, Friday, and some more. Up almost another basis point on a two-year, 426 on a two-year yield after standing the week, Tom, with a three handle, sat the 4%. Moments ago, as you write your bear market note, I'm cautious for the weekend. You're looking forward, John, and the answer is you're doing it within a VIX of 15.99. We have just moments ago fallen below 16. On the, the VIX, this is a 15 handle is the language, 15.99. I know it's not that much different from 16, but yes, it's really, really different. A 15 on the VIX, down from 20, sweat, 30, real sweat. 40 massive angst were miles from the toxic brew of a VIX of 27. Just eating away at the consensus views out there at the moment. In foreign exchange as well. Let's finish on the euro. So we come into this year. It's basically this story that things are going to dip, then they're going to rip. Dip in the first half, rip in the second half. And you want to be overweight Europe in a big way. Well, if you were overweight, the luxury players, it's delivered in a big way. The euro threatened 111 just a couple of weeks ago. It's back down to 107, just about 108 right now. A break of 108 in the last 24 hours. And the data started to shift, started to crack in the other direction. And Lisa, I got note after note yesterday. Just opened the inbox in the gym. Deutsche Bank, Callum Ruskin, Jordan Rochester, Namura. The morning started with sock gens, Kit Jukes, talking up just eating away at those rate cut calls for the second half, encouraged by President Logan of the Dallas Fed. <coughs> eating away at some of those dollar shorts as well. So at what point can you basically go long the dollar or just gird for the chop that could potentially chop your head off if you're on the wrong side of a choppy day? I am really interested in the specific names because those stories are perhaps clearer than the overarching macro story. Foot Locker, we were just talking about, we're not going to get into stealth wealth again. Uh, but basically, this concept of revenue declining as much as 8% this year, even with inflation, just to put that out there, previously said the drop might be about 5.5%. Those shares severely lower, I'm sure we'll be talking about existential risk in not so uh, short a time, 25% decline. Dear, we've been talking about this uh, incredible beat. Their net income for the quarter rose to $2.86 billion from $2.10 billion. It's just to give you a sense of how significant this has been, 30% growth in sales. Is this just simply the farm trade? Disney shares I have on here, not because this move is interesting, but because there have been a number of stories that really were interesting overnight. The political story was... Walmart canceling two significant investments in Florida, one for their campus, right, yeah, and the other, yeah. they have this Star Wars-themed hotel that Disney they're closing. Does, yeah, yeah. yeah, But the other one, ESPN, spinning off into its own entity that you have to pay for separately. Very interesting at a time when yeah. so many people have been talking about them selling it in a more significant way. That could, last point is yeah. Wall Street Journal reporting. You and I were talking about this a little bit earlier this morning. Tom, I'd love to know how they're going to price that. Because the model at the moment basically involves people who pay for cable, who don't watch ESPN, but ESPN ends up getting the money. How are they going to price that? So MSG's new streaming service, which offers New York Knicks and Buffalo Sabres games, is priced at $30 a month. Oof, That's according to the Wall Street just, Journal report. I saw that number and I was like, you got to be kidding me. No one at my house watches TV. I get it for sports. And I guess I'm paying the ginormous amount I'm paying to watch 10 minutes of the tots a little bit of Mets baseball, which is on regular TV now, and all the rest I'm watching off MLB. You know, everybody's got their own anecdote, their own story, but the answer is I don't know where big numbers like $30 come from when I'm getting Mandalorian for $6, or maybe I'm getting it free. I don't even You'd know. You'd have to imagine that's the end of the cable bundle if they do <clears throat> come out of that. Oh, it's huge. That, it's that, 100%. Would the, that would be they, the end of it, right? The death now, uh, uh, 100%. And I don't have the exact numbers here, but in, particularly for our international audience, if you pay $60, $70 a month, ESPN gets $9. Everybody else gets like yeah. two. I'm and not even sure what the influence. cable bundle even means anymore. I technically have a bundle. It's called Hulu, and it has everything <laughs> on it, right? It just streams. I don't yeah. have that silly box anymore. And if I have Hulu, I'd imagine surely ESPN's going to be a feature on Hulu still. You don't want Given the that box. Disney's... You cut the cord simply because you don't like Precisely. cords. Precisely. You don't like we've boxes. We've talked about this before. We've talked about <laughs> this. I was not the, the only one who did that. Really? It's just so much easier just to have 
a TV connected to broadband and then you have a streaming package like Hulu that has everything on it, YouTube, take your pick, whatever it might be, then have someone come around and fit a box and have cables all around the house. Who so, wants that? So buy it here, thirty nine ninety nine. You know, <laughs> whatever. On. I mean, I'm not here to sell cable. <laughs> I'm not here to sell cable, that's for sure. TKU. I actually find the interesting story around Disney, the, la the former. Yeah, I would and, agree. And Florida. Governor DeSantis is a very interesting guy. He wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, I think a couple of months ago, which I encourage everyone to read. I wonder if he's just too smart for his own good sometimes. And when you start to embrace the go woke, go broke thing, are you leaving behind this idea that the Republican Party stands for being the party of business? Because there's a little bit of tension here at the moment that's emerging. A little. I mean, it's, this it's is not good. Yeah. It's not good. Which is the reason why this $900 million investment that is not going to be made in Florida could potentially be Disney's uh, revenge. And this is going to be a really interesting moment uh, for the governor of Florida. You just wonder how this is going to play now. The governor hasn't announced his run yet. There's some speculation that might happen after Memorial Day weekend uh, later this month, Tom. And I don't really buy into the polls. The polls are too early for me. It's still too early for me, Tom. I think when you get polled, you just go and say, I'm oh, going to vote see. for the person I know yeah most and that's going to be the former president so let's see what it happens after he there's, announces then as a few months ago and around the country and gets more broadcast interviews and there's all miles of the and miles it's ages, it's ages miles away miles ages away I don't have that. but i'm interested in what the strategy will be mm. are you just going to talk about woke 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 liberal policies this liberal policies no. that or are you going to stand for something a little bit more than that and uh, let's see how it develops well I, we're, we're going to have to see and we've got a team that's going to go through that and part of it is folding in the culture wars into what we do here on economics finance investment you've got to read here in the george and the Boria, culture wars in the federal reserve yeah. right yeah. now this is george bory of all spring weighing in on the fed's path forward and saying this with the fed much closer to the end of rate tightening than to its beginning Fixed income investors should start a position for the eventual normalization of the yield curve. This includes extending duration and positioning Tom for a steeper curve. George Borey writes brilliant, sharp, sharp, short notes and does this so much so with Allspring because he's visiting their clients nonstop. The chief investment strategist for Allspring joins us this morning on fixed income. George, in the equity markets, we comfortably say to strategists, what are you hearing from your clients? We rarely say that in the bond market. In all the meetings you're having at All Spring, four hundred gazillion dollars of assets. What do investors in bonds feel now? What do they want to do? Yeah, Tom, Lisa, John, thanks for having me on this morning. Good morning. Uh, great question, Tom. You know, what do clients want to do? Well, it's two things really. Number one, they're reconditioning themselves to yield. Yields moved higher. We know that it's been talked about, the curve's inverted, but they're trying to optimize their yield positions. Now that means if you're an individual, you're pulling tremendous amount of money towards the front end of the curve. We see it in the flow data, we see it in the conversations, we see it in our own activity kind of across the curve. What we try to do is sort of encourage clients to sort of think beyond just tomorrow to think a little bit beyond three months out. Very difficult to do. Try to get clients to sort of extend their duration by longer maturity bonds. And in doing so, kind of lock in today's yield for the future. We know that as you get close to a pause in the Fed cycle, bonds tend to do well. But if you wait for that Goldilocks moment, when the Fed is either on hold or maybe even cutting, well, then you've left a tremendous amount of return on the table, the opportunity cost of sitting in cash goes up from this point, not down. And that's what we're trying to encourage clients. The second, the second component is for your duration buyer, your pension fund, your insurance company, your long duration manager. Now those folks look at this market and say, I don't need to be a hero. I can lock in the type of yield that an institutional investor typically wants, which is different than an individual, but five to 6% yields for 10, 20, or 30 years is precisely what that institutional investor wants. And so there's this kind of tension in the market. Consumers kind of moving towards the front end, institutional going towards the long end, and then all the macro that goes behind it. And so, you know, we've seen bond markets fall down into a little bit of a range. We're at the upper end of the range for, say, the uh, the 10-year the right now. 
But that sort of next phase of the cycle is precisely what bond investors should be looking at right now. It's not tomorrow, but it is coming. Just and quickly, that's how we're trying to set up portfolios. Just quickly, George, because you can do coupon clipping in the credit space, is the credit market immune to some of the very painful chop that is evident throughout many other macro markets? Now, the credit markets, you know, are, are doing well. And I think there's a, there's a clear segmentation, you know, and, and the companies themselves, the big, large, sort of well-capitalized investment grade and, and a large percentage of high-yield companies are, are, are in good shape. Inflation's not a universal bad. You, you put up the, the earnings reports of, of companies earlier, you know, and you have a, a, a wide range of companies that are doing very well right now. It's a very segmented market. So credit selection becomes absolutely critical. But there are good companies out there, and those good companies are still paying attractive coupons. And so that coupon clipping and that compounding in portfolios is very, very powerful. Now, we've, we're watching stocks move higher, just like everyone else, but we're sort of also watching the bond market generate sort of nice, solid returns and kicking off the coupon that you can then use to either reinvest, to spend, to pay out. You could do whatever you want with it, but that's that very different dynamic that we're seeing in the bond market today than we saw, you know, 12 and 18 months ago. So it's that it's that reconditioning of why do I own a bond, and 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 how should it perform in my portfolio? Yeah, we're having those conversations every single day, and so bonds are back. They're back in the central part of many investors' portfolios, and they're sort of aligning themselves, them being bonds, very nicely with equities and kind of help create that diversification in your portfolio. Massive change. George, wonderful to get your perspective. Thank you, sir. George Borey there <coughs> of Allspring Global much. Investments. I was in a cabin this morning, saw another taxi pull up alongside me. They have those commercials on top. There it was, 5%, open an account, 5%. Let's go. That's the change. I mean, that's a massive change from where we've been in the last, the last decade. advertised. That's from my youth. That's just a massive change. Yeah. Coming up, 8.15, about 30 minutes from now, Henry de Trace of Vader Partners on the debt debate in She'll Washington. She'll fix it. She'll fix it, all right. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. White House negotiators say they are making steady progress toward reaching a debt limit deal. In a call from Japan, where President Biden is attending the Group of Summit Summit, Biden told them he's confident Congress will act in time to avoid a default. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy has said both sides may reach an agreement as soon as this weekend. The G7 nations will agree to work together to track diamonds from Russia. But Bloomberg's learned they will stop short of slapping Moscow with an outright ban. Earlier attempts to sanction Russian gems in Europe have met resistance from importer nations like Belgium. Those countries argue that such moves would just shift the diamond trade elsewhere. The 14 countries in the U.S.-led Indo-Pacific trade talks are close to an agreement on supply chain coordination. Bloomberg's learned a deal could be announced as soon as next week. The focus is on systems that would provide early warnings when countries see a risk of supply chains being disrupted. Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein suffered serious complications during her extended illness. According to a spokesperson, they included encephalitis and a neurological disorder that can arise from shingles virus. Feinstein turns 90 next month. She was absent from the Capitol for months and has announced she won't seek re-election next year. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. Our viewpoint is that is that because the fundamental basis is still there, again, to your point, there's been some let's call it uh, bubbly conversations about AI, and, and that, that's something that the markets have been responsive to. But until we see corporations really hold back on CapEx related to communication services and big data and cybersecurity, it's a tough area to really be uh, you know, not investing in. Eric Friedman there, the CIO of US Bank Asset Management. Some monster moves in the tech sector so far year today. NVIDIA up by close to 117% 
Biggest gainer on the S&P 500. Second biggest, Meta, up by more than 105% year to date. Just absolutely phenomenal. Michael Hartnett of Bank of America wank in on AI this morning. AI for now, a quote, baby bubble, goes on to say, <coughs> bubbles in the right things, e.g. internet, the wrong things, e.g. housing, always started by easy money, always ended by rate hikes. What's interesting about this, of course, is this one is developing, if indeed you would characterize it as one, and I'm not saying that I do, but this is happening, Tom, against the backdrop of 5% interest rates of the Fed. It is. Well, that's the fold in the financial into it. What's the level of hysteria of the weekend, the three of us right now, before we get to Mandy uh, Singer, what's the level of AI, you know, ferment this weekend? FOMO, big time. Missed out on this. Missed out on this. Well, but is you're Apple whether you up get because in. of AI? I don't think so. No, not Apple, no. But other names are. I would say, though, it's sort of the one side is FOMO if you're an investor and if you're, you know, a humanitarian concerned about the demise of, of civilization, which is the, some of the articles, the tenor of some of the no, articles yes, that I've been reading yes. are really questioning the role of human beings in a society where robots can do it better. I said this earlier. If you believe that, <laughs> get so long it hurts. Seriously, greatest insurance policy going. If you believe that, then you should be super. Long. John mentions the bubble of this, and that's their <laughs> fault. There's famed Lost in Hanover, top. New Hampshire. <laughs> in Hanover, New Hampshire, the Dartmouth bubble, and it's their fault in 1956, where four bright, bright people got together and began to think about AI. So it's Dartmouth's fault. To provide further wisdom, 70 years down the road, Mandeep Singh steps in here on this frenzied debate. Let's just start with the, the camp of it. Is this something that's fermenting that's just going to go away like it's gone away seven times before, back to Google search and back to that fateful meeting in Dartmouth? Well, so think of the evolution, right? Uh, in the last 10 years, what we have seen is machine learning uh, coming to the scene and really enhancing the productivity in the sense that it can recommend you stuff which you may be thinking along. And this is the logical evolution in terms of the AI getting smarter from machine learning recommendations to voice assistants. So what's different now? The difference is it can be your personalized voice assistant. It can be an assistant to a student who is looking to learn new concepts. And it can be so real time and so accurate that it will make you productive. And that is where we are going with this because of the amount of data, the digitization that has happened over the last 10, 15 years, I think, uh, the algorithms are getting smarter and smarter. Easy to call this a bubble. It's always easy. I'm always reminded of this video. There's this great clip that gets circulated around the internet every now and again. I believe it's from the late 90s. Do you remember Sears? Yes. Remember Sears? Great. Yeah, of course. There was a journalist that went around, I think for 60 minutes. You might know what I'm talking about. And they went to interview an analyst about Amazon, why Amazon was priced in the stock market <coughs> as a bigger company than Sears. And the journalist there, very smugly, looked at the analyst at the time and said, this is ridiculous. Are you telling me that Amazon, this company that sells books, should be worth more than, than Sears? Than Sears. You know, what's Sears? A lot of kids watching this are like, what, what on earth is Sears? I don't want to be that guy in moments like this. And I would suggest strongly to other people as well that you don't want to be that guy either. Is that one of these moments right now when we talk about this kind of technology and the changes that you're anticipating in the future? It definitely feels like one simply because every year there is a new buzzword. Last year it was Web 3.0, you know, blockchain, but it never caught up to that level where you could think, you know, it'll be that disruptive. Right now we are talking about the chip industry getting disrupted. We may not need as many CPUs as we uh, used to uh, deploy before because GPUs are more effective in parallel processing. The format of search may change simply because uh, we are uh, we liking that format of summaries and, you know, different kind of searches with, with virtual assistants. So, those are the type of things where you're disrupting existing industries. I think that is what was missing with some of the earlier technologies and the buzzwords, and that's why I think this is more real. There's a big question about whether all of the prowess in the AI race will be <clears throat> locked up in the Googles of the world, the Microsofts, or whether it will be a more democratic process of development around a whole host of smaller firms. What's your view of this? How, how big of a cushion could this have for a broad swath of the tech industry? Yeah, so... I think there will be evolution of standards. <clears throat> think of you know the evolution of internet. Clearly, uh, there needed to be more standards just to, uh, and, and I think regulators will come into the scene as well in terms of how AI gets developed, what kind of data are we allowed to use. Right now, the 
uh, chat GPT models are built on open internet data as well as when you think about Google, it's using both open internet as well as its own first party data. Same thing with Meta. Amazon, and all the internet companies have an inherent advantage because of all the data that they have. So we've been talking about the Armageddon type of situation where robots can impersonate humans. We don't know who's what. You can have all sorts of manipulation. And oh yeah, a lot of people are thrown out of work and have to rely on some sort of universal base income in order to exist. Are we heading toward that type of dystopian existence based on some of the automation and what you're seeing? I mean, I, I think you can automate a lot of tasks and where I think AI can make a difference is in terms of, let's say, autonomous software. I mean, people don't talk about it as much in the in this context of ChatGPT, but for me, uh, you know, auto driving is also ChatGPT type of a situation where you are leveraging large amounts of data and you are making uh, that decision in real time. So uh, there are so many use cases where you can drive productivity as a result of mm -hmm. the large amounts of data and processing that you have available. So I don't think it's going to be the uh, you know er all the jobs disappearing or that kind of a situation. Well, but to me, it's about productivity and what helps you drive that productivity. Well, let's cut to the reality. Yesterday was the annual Mrs. King. Can we just throw out some of these books discussion? And I'm holding in my hand David Blanche Flower's classic, The Wage Curve, a giant of economics at Dartmouth, et cetera. Is AI going to replace David Blanche Flower's classic book, The Wage Curve? Is AI going to replace Blanche Flower lecturing at Dartmouth in macroeconomics? I think AI can help you teach basic concepts in a way where, you know, it, it creates a level playing field for students in a class. Not everyone can pick up the concepts right away. And this allows you know, somebody who, who can work through it, who has a personal assistant, and really may not get as much uh, you know, uh, Professor Blanche Flower's time as the, he may want in the class. Education has to change. I saw a really good take on this, that when you had the calculator, you had to change the math class. It's as simple as that. You know, we're all going to pretend that we need to do half the things we need to learn at school when it's at your fingertips. It's never really made sense to me that education has not really changed with the birth of all of this technology over well, the last several decades. And I think they're gonna have to change real quick. And whether it's just simply removing the access to ChatGPT or those types of programs isn't gonna be enough. It's gonna to have to be a different type of teaching I, with critical thinking and the use of you know I, ameliorated kinds of uh, devices. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, I'm gonna go the other way. What this is gonna do is a separation of people that totally get it, have done the grunt courses, that have passed the exams, like Mandeep Singh, and everybody else is gonna be faking it with AI. There's gonna be an elite group ever more elite group, John, of people that worship Alan Turing and did the hard work. Okay. And will they have social skills? Will they have their Hell work done? No. <laughs> the no. I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting a recommendation for one Bloomberg <clears throat> of Friday of Lisa Positivity. So one of these, one of these Fridays... I will. Um, I will yeah, try to be not discussing you know, Armageddon and you know the potential for <laughs> disintermediating humanity. But you know we'll get there. Mandeep Singh, <laughs> Bloomberg Intelligence. Was that meant to be constructive? Because that that didn't sound constructive. Well, no. What was that? No, I don't know. I mean, to be completely honest, listen, a little punchy, Mandy. I'm sorry. I think that, you know, look, John, this, these are the questions think. that people have been talking about, though, be, and, and it, it's not uh, really that under the yeah. radar. Mandeep, is this something you've been talking about? Well, clearly, it could affect everyone's job, even research analyst's job. So uh, I think we are thinking about <laughs> how we'll Get to work. Yeah. There you go. Uh, but Anna Ragrana will be okay. Uh, the two-year yield, John, I'm sorry. That's the story of the morning. Okay. There's a transition. All right. Mandy, yeah. thank you. I'm sorry. Let's you know, I don't market. need AI to know that. Very close to 430. <clears throat> 427. Yields up every single day this week. We'll talk about the equity side of things in just a moment. The equity market on the S&P 500, nine months highs at the close yesterday. David Bain on the city coming up very, very shortly. Have you been in this market on the long side? If you haven't, you're starting to feel tempted. Are you anxious about doing so? We'll talk to David about all those things in just a moment. What do you always say, Tom? The courage to be in the stock market. The courage, yes. How much courage you do you need the right courage now? courage to be in there. How much courage yes. do you need? right now. David Balin coming up, Chairman Powell a little bit later this morning. We'll count you down to the Fed Chair later today.
The economic data is, is slowing enough that the Fed is able to take their foot off of the brakes. I don't think that we will see a hike. I think the Fed actually is at terminal. If the Fed wants to raise rates, it's going to really hurt the economy. We think the Fed is paused here, but there are myriad options for policy after that. It's quite possible that we do get that soft landing that the FOMC is aiming for. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramos, and Tom Keen. On a Friday, it is a bull market Friday. We welcome all of you on radio and television. Where to begin, John? I'm going to go to the VIX under 1615.95. And the bond market, Tom, a two-year yield with a bad a 30 basis point range so far this week. We opened up at 398. The two-year right now, let's call it 427. That's been a big change, encouraged by the words of President Logan of the Dallas Fed just yesterday when she said the data in the coming weeks could yet show that it is appropriate to skip a meeting. As of today, we aren't there yet. She's leaving that door wide open to a move next month. Skipping a meeting is the president of the United States, root at dinner. It's one of those dinners, John, where they got four forks on the left side and six spoons, and there's a spoon above the plate I don't know what to do with. Soup, Biden's isn't it? excellent. Isn't that the soup? No, that's a dessert. No, that's a no, dessert a spoon. It's a dessert spoon. Oh, that, I've been getting it wrong for the time. <laughs> yeah, it's green. I've always been reaching that for John. the time. Red on this side. Oh, you start drink on the outside, on this come side, in. and then Thank you, you. Come Appreciate it. Very that. good. Every good. green tea ice cream Please the president's missing. Up. John, seriously, the president's standing up at dinner and he's coming back because he's got things to worry about, and that's part of this market list. It's part of the theatre. I think they want us to be talking about that. The president's abroad, but he's got his eye on the ball. He's going to leave a dinner early and have a chat about where we are in negotiations. Even if he was at the dinner, they'd update him <clears> on the negotiations. Fact of the matter is, when he comes back, there's some hope there will be a framework for an agreement. Fact of the matter is, and these are the real facts, the Treasury's cash balance has come all the way in from 140 last week, Tom, to something <clears> like $60 billion right now, $68 billion to be specific. we got a really important global Wall Street debt guest to stay with us. And Lisa, this goes to what Citigroup can do. Tim Thien just reporting on John Deere with a 36% upside on his reaffirmation of a buy. This week's chop has turned into this week's potential optimism or glimmers of shoots of something uh, where perhaps people <clears throat> are taking some tail risks off the table, including the debt ceiling debate to tie these two ideas together. So here's the question. At what point will corporate resilience really lead the way up in the sense that there is optimism and capital expenditure and, oh, yeah, wow. profits as people keep spending. Nice lift to the market, John. SPX up three-tenths of a percent after that big day yesterday. Let's start the data with the VIX, 15.96. Equities up by, let's call it 0.25 percent on the <clears throat> S&P 500. Two decent days of gains on the S&P. Biggest two-day bop going back to April, I believe. The highest level we've seen since August 25th. And as you know, that was the day before <clears throat> Chairman Powell spoke on August 26th in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I mean, talking up pain. We had some pain going into October, November time. And Tom, we're back to where we were. 41.98 at the close yesterday, 41.98 at the open when the chairman spoke in Jackson Hole. A huge, huge Friday to recalibrate. And of course, we'll all do that after the Thomas Laubach Research Conference uh, with Bernanke and Powell and others gathered in honor of Tom Laubach, who came up with our start. Forget about the theory. Mostly for some people, it's about missing a bull market off the October lows. For others, it's recalibrating. And I'm going to suggest for many others, it's just the fear and maybe being in cash. David Balin advises this morning, chief investment officer for City Global Wealth. You had the courage to be in the markets throughout all of this process. Reassess the courage right now. How do you have the courage to be in a market after this run to 4222? Well, it's not a cheap market, Tom, and, and, and that's not really the point. If you take a look at what's happened right over the last year, this is a perfect example of why market timing is absolutely terrible. And it's a question then of what you own and not when you own it, right? So it's what's in the equity portfolio. For a long time, last you know 12 months, we've been defensively positioned right into, into companies that are high quality with dividends and all of that, and that's paid off. And now you're seeing a rotation, right? And you've talked about this on your program into AI and tech, which makes sense because you're going through a revolutionary period of time, right? Getting exposure to these stocks and more importantly, getting exposure to the companies who will use these, this technology, right, is going to be extremely important. And that should be in one's portfolio. And then there are pockets of value that are still out there, right? I mean, take a look at what financials look like today. If you really ask yourself a year from now whether or not financial stocks will be higher, you have to imagine that they're well capitalized, they're going to, they're going to tolerate what's going on in the market now and the, and the move away from deposits. But ultimately, this is essential to our economy, and it, it should not be marked down 30%. So there are things to buy. 
And the most important thing is to look forward as you go about buying them. Well, let's talk about allocating to some of those themes. The answer to this question, I hear it a lot on financial news programs. How much should I allocate to one thing? How much should I allocate to another? Isn't that just highly dependent on who you are, how old you are, where well, you are in life? Yeah, I mean, obviously, when you do you know, wealth planning and financial planning, you have to determine you know, what your spending patterns are and you have to actually have a plan, right? But regardless of that, if you think about how a portfolio should be constructed, an equity portfolio should be one's best ideas, right? In exposure to different markets at different times. And there are some you know, great and obvious ideas. A great example today, which we never talk about, right, because we're so focused on the U.S. and on AI, is just the fact that right now you've got you know, foreign stocks at their cheapest level, right, as cheap as they've been since back to 1935. You've got the dollar at its highest level and rising recently, right, due to the rates. And yet no one talks about putting money overseas right now. And I think it is a gimme. And that's an example of where, you know, you do asset allocation. But it's not. And so what's going to happen, I think, over the between now and the end of, of you know, several months from now is people are begin focusing on 24 and they're going to want to have higher equity allocations than they do right now. Have you been basically building your equity uh, slice or are you basically even weight when it comes to places like private credit that still offer a tremendous amount of yield. Well, let's, let's talk about that. So we, we've been slowly moving up our equities, right, in terms of the, our, our allocation to them. But the point you just made is extraordinary. And again, you know, think about it from an investment store to point of view. If you can get in the fixed income market an equity-like rate of return and sustain that for the next three or four years, should you do it? Absolutely. And private credit is a great example. You know, bank loan products, you know, a variety of mortgage-related REITs, things like that are yielding between 12 and 14 percent due to the illiquidity right now. And the credit risk that was there in 08 is not there now. These are the kinds of things that should be put into portfolios on the fixed income side. The other thing I wanted to mention is that, because you, you've touched upon this in a variety of your programs this week, is your people who are focused on deposit rates or are focused on one-month yields are going to miss the fact that now is the time to move their duration out and actually build resilient portfolios and fixed income that hold, for, for their cash portions, hold those rates for longer. Given that that's your belief, you think that rates are going to come down. Is this period of time a golden period, ironically, even though the chop feels not particularly golden in any way, shape, or form? But are you seeing this period where you have an opportunity for outsized returns that won't come again after this period ends, after rates return and normalize? Right. That's right, Lisa. I mean, we, you just talked about it in private credit. You're going to see the same thing in the bond market because we are investing into a slowing economy. There's no doubt that the, the Fed action, what's gone on with banks, you know, in fact, even the resolution of the debt agreement that you know, we're talking about this coming week, maybe, um, that's going to be uh, you know, take away stimulus. It's going to take liquidity out of the marketplace after it, after it happens. So all of that's going to slow the economy. So we're, we're now talking about investing for 2024, looking over the horizon of the slowing economy to what the market will look like next year. And, and that's really what's going on in the markets right now, as far as we're concerned. David, you mentioned opportunities abroad, and you threw out some interesting numbers, and I just want to work through them with you. Yeah. DAX is at a record high today. Euro stocks 50 year today is up close to 20 percent. Someone's buying it. Oh, no, I'm talking about emerging market equity specifically. Oh, you're going right. to yeah, EM specific. right, okay. right, right, EM specifically. No, so obviously those there. markets. Right. Let's yeah. go there. What's That's right. happening there? Because Chinese data started to disappoint and some people are reluctant to chase that story. What is it about EM for you that works? Well, what works is that you have a lot of companies, right, that are operating, whether it's in Brazil or in China, right, where their earnings stories are actually, you know, picking up markedly. You know, we saw a bunch of good even earnings from Internet stocks in China and they're being completely ignored, right? So we're overweight in that market because you're buying there at an incredibly good valuation. In Brazil, same thing. You're buying when the, you know, they've done a great job. Real yields there are 9%. Their rates are going to come down. They're a beneficiary of the Chinese market, right? And they're going to and they're going to benefit, I think, in terms of their stock price appreciation. But you have to do this in anticipation. When it's not fun to do it, that's when you have to do it, right? And that's the same thing you were talking about with AI, which is you have to think about which companies are going to benefit by, by building an AI department the way they've built their IT department. Those companies that decide to use it are going to be the beneficiaries of it, and you can identify them. How do you identify them right now? Well, you think about uh, – just, just think about this. Um, you think about, let's say, a, a consulting company. I can't name the – you know, whatever. How, how is they might not be able to. Right. How is, there, how, how is it that they're going to right, modify the business that they're going to provide to clients? They're going to teach AI. They're going to help cl companies build in AI. So in the consulting industry, you're going to find that. Companies that actually go out and, you know, build models using AI in terms of financial services. And you can identify who's doing it because they're going to talk about it. My, my joke internally is that AI will tell you who's using AI. And, and that's what I mean literally. You'll be able to see which companies are actually using it. 
And that, to me, is going to be a determinant in, uh, in how do you go about investing. Let's go back to Walter Riston, who would say that U.S. multinationals have international exposure. There's a small startup in Cupertino where something like 60 percent of revenues of Apple is foreign revenues. Can we go back to the old days where people can buy U.S. multinationals as a foreign proxy? I'm not exactly sure because of the valuation difference. Let's flip it around and talk about, you know, energy stocks in uh, in Europe. You know, they're saying at a 40 percent discount to energy stocks in the U.S. Which would you rather own? They're both multinational. With a big dividend. That's exactly correct. So my view is you have to be conscious of valuation, right? Right now, you know, everyone is very focused on the U.S. Uh, when we look at 2024, I think people, people are going to be focused on global investing much more than they are in U.S. investing. Interesting. David, this was great and wonderful. I've said this a few times this week already, but great to see you in person. Yeah, I, know, I love the fact it's that we're all together. Long, right? Yes, exactly. It's, 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 it's fantastic. And, and Jonathan, you need to invest in the company that makes a dessert spoon. I agree. I think Got to make right. that happen. Is that at the top or is it's that a, on the It's just on at the, the top. You're doing good. Yeah, yeah that's Thank right. Thank you, buddy. I'll well. keep doing that. Appreciate it. <laughs> I like the small ones. David Bailin, a city global WAF. Appreciate it. Let's get to the euro just briefly. 108 on the euro against the dollar. President Lagarde speaking to the media at the moment. The ECB needs to buckle up and deliver the inflation target. <laughs> Interest rates still need to be sustainably high. I think that's the key word, sustainably yeah. high. They're determined to deliver their 2% CPI target. Now, remember, this is a single mandate central bank, Tom, and that target is 2%. It's like it's Friday. I wonder if Hugh Pill of the Bank of England's listening. It's like, we got to toughen up and get this done. There's a few small extenuating circumstances, including a war in Ukraine. Amazing. Claudia Sam's coming up. Brilliant. The former Federal Reserve economist joining us in about 20 minutes' time. Looking forward to that. From New York City with equity futures just about positive. Let's call it 0.2% on the <clears throat> S&P. This is Bloomberg. you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. President Biden is urging his negotiators to keep pursuing a debt limit deal. In a call from Japan, where he's attending the G7 summit, the president said he's confident that Congress will act in time and avoid a default. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy has indicated both sides may reach an agreement as soon as this weekend. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky will travel to Japan to join the G7 leaders in person. Officials have added an extra session to the summit schedule on Sunday to accommodate his schedule. Over the past week, Zelensky visited European capitals asking for more weapons. A new report from Barclays says a Netflix addiction is turning into a structural drag on the Japanese yen. According to Strategics, J Japan's so-called digital deficit stems from payments to overseas tech companies such as Netflix and Amazon. Now they say a continued expansion will put pressure on the yen. Republican Senator Tim Scott reportedly will begin airing TV ads in Iowa and New Hampshire next week. According to the Associated Press, Scott also plans an announcement on his potential run for president Monday in his hometown, North Charleston, South Carolina. Last month, Scott formed an exploratory committee, allowing him to raise money while weighing a White House bid. Shares of Foot Locker are plunging. The sports shoe retailer cut its full year sales outlook and reported first quarter sales that fell more than 9%. Foot Locker also said that merchandise inventories were 25% higher than at the end of the first quarter last year. Global News powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. The market's not pricing in a recession, far from it. I think the market's pricing in normalization. If we actually do enter a recession, and in our view, it's going to be a recession, you know, because of the bank lending standards, because of the lagged impact of rate hikes as, as the consumer savings buffer runs out. And now we might even have fiscal drag. I think the only way to get a debt ceiling deal is to get that fiscal drag. Priya Misra there, the head of global rate strategy at TD Securities, going into a really interesting weekend where we're looking for some kind of agreement, a framework for a deal between Kevin McCarthy, the Speaker of the House, and the President of the United States, a deal that could get through Congress just as the Treasury cash balance keeps coming down, 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 down over the last week or so. Going into that mess, if you can 
call it a mess, going into the opening bell about an hour and 13 minutes away. We've had a decent rally into Friday over the last two days or so. On the S&P, we had a bit more weight to that rally. On the S&P right now, positive by 0.2%. Yields are shifting higher again on a 10-year 366 on a two-year right now, 426 Starting the week at 398, ending at Tom, close yeah. to 430. Did Lagarde just take the stuffing out of this uh, in Friday enthusiasm? Gave the euro some life. Yeah. Pushed it back no, through I, 108. And you wonder what Paul and Bernanke are going to do. Is it 11 a.m. this morning? Are they going to do the same thing? Boom. We'll see what Chairman Powell... If Chairman Powell says what Logan <clears throat> said yesterday, then you've got a big move on your hands. Yeah. I, I, don't I don't know how he manages that later. You know, I mean, I'm day, I'm day trading triple leverage all cash fund. It's been working How's out well. How's that working out? Nice. SPX 4200, I'm getting grayer by what the What kind moment. of yield are you offering these days, TK? We got a coupon. And, and seriously, that's the theme this morning. George Borey, there's a coupon out there. David Balin, Citigroup, there's a coupon out there. Priya Misra, there's a coupon out there. A lot of people like me are living when, you know, there's no yield. It's a different market. And Lisa, you've been great on this. I mean, it's not just three months. You know, you can go out a little bit further. Well, this is that's really the weight that's kind of pulling people from getting too bullish on stocks, because why go into stocks if you can get 5% in bonds? It's going to be interesting to see. Let's go to Washington right now. Amory Horton in Japan. So instead, we're in Washington. A director at Veda Partners, Henrietta Trace, with serious Capitol Hill cred. Let's uh, move, translate the reality of this Friday, Henrietta Trace. And that's the idea of recess. Ready, set. There's a great crisis. Wait, Senator Schumer is going to say, no, we're going to recess. So we're running out of money. You and I have been in the cash room at the Treasury. We're literally going to run out of gold cash notes. And the senator from New York is saying, recess? It's incredible. You can really um, watch the Treasury Secretary. You can watch the both bracket banks and their predictions. But you can actually set your watch to the congressional calendar to figure out when they're going to pass a debt ceiling bill. That's what I do. Um, and it works every time. Just pay attention to the congressional recess schedule for sure. What does it say right now? Right now, it says that we're probably going to see bill text on Sunday, Monday morning, maybe. Um, Speaker McCarthy will file the bipartisan bill that he and President Biden's team reach uh, over this weekend. They will hopefully not vote on a bill in the House until Wednesday or Thursday of next week. Anything before that, and I'm very anxious about a tarp-like moment where the bill will fail, because uh, the House is moving first here, which means the Democrats on the House side who historically provide the bulk of the votes and the critical votes for a debt ceiling hike are not going to have political cover from the Democrats in the Senate having voted first. So we're going to see the House move first. Um, and I hope that there will not be a vote until Wednesday or Thursday of next week. At that point, Senator Schumer could call the caucus back. He has indicated that he will call them back within 24 hours notice. But 11th hour in D.C. really does mean the 11th hour. And they could well not come back until Tuesday, May 30th, two days before the X date, and pass the bill in the Senate next Tuesday or Wednesday. Well, That's what I'm bracing our investors for. That's what I'm expecting. Henrietta, to that point, what is the risk that there is a technical default because there is a mistake that someone mistimes this, that there is a bill that gets rejected or intransigent members of a party? I do not think that there is any risk of that, uh, to be honest. I am afraid of a TARP-like vote in the early part of next week if Speaker McCarthy puts a bill on the floor Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I think the odds of a failed vote are about 40 percent, but that's a good week before we actually need the bill to pass. I think that's your biggest risk point. After that, I understand there's a lot of hay being made about, hey, the bill needs to sit for 72 hours. We need 10 days to get it through. If you're from the Senate, if you're from the House, if you've seen these bills come into law before, they can work all night long and get this done. And in fact, they will. I think the risk of default is 2%. Uh, I don't buy the hype. I have not bought the hype uh, this entire process. You guys know. Um, I, I don't think there's a risk of default. So then why all the hype made by Congress members, made by the president himself? Why all the discussion about how this is not anywhere close, given the fact what has changed over the past two weeks? I mean, quite honestly, if, if you want me to get on my soapbox for just a little minute, the last time we had a balanced budget was under the Clinton administration. And instead of using that surplus to pay down the deficit, what do we do in 01? We pass tax cuts. What do we do in 03? We pass more tax cuts. We blow out the deficit, continue doing that into the Obama years, did it again in the Trump years, $7.8 trillion worth of deficit hikes. And now all of a sudden we're in the Biden administration post-COVID with looming $3 trillion tax 
expect expirations happening in 2026 and we're talking about 500 billion dollars worth of deficit reduction it is a political show that is designed to say hey the republican party cares a lot about federal spending they are fiscal hawks they care about the deficit no new taxes and democrats have to explain what it is that they support spending money on tanf or working family aid uh the energy department the uh energy tax credits that were just passed it's it's really just about scoring political points that's what it's always been and that's where we are in this charade and now we're at the 11th hour so we're going to stop posturing and actually vote on the bill i would suggest the charade began i believe it was in new hampshire with george bush senior where he got run over on the tax verbiage that we've been living for years and years. Let's assume that tax verbiage doesn't change. So what happens next? Obviously, everybody's going to want a tax cut. Everybody wants a free lunch, right? Better believe it. So in 2025, right after this next presidential election cycle, the entirety of the 2017 tax cuts on the individual side expire. The salt deduction comes back in, but all of the individual tax rates go back to their 2017 levels. So at that point, we're probably going to blow out the deficit again by temporarily extending those packages uh, for another year or two, just like we did in 2010 and again in 2012. Um, if there is a red wave in the 24 election, what you can see is a material reconciliation bill that is basically a repeat of 2017. That was a $5 trillion tax bill, $1.5 trillion, which was deficit financed. So you can very easily see that all over again, although this time it was more expensive in 2026. Rinse and repeat. Can't wait. Henrietta Trades there, Aveda Partners. I think you've got a sense for how Henrietta feels about all of this. Rinse and repeat until you can't anymore. And that, Tom, is the problem. (laughs) The issue is we've been talking about this for a long, long time, and that debt pile just keeps on growing, keeps on growing. Yeah, it it does. And what's so important here is the free lunch we've had from our technological superiority, maybe our demographics, maybe the immigration push of a number of years ago, where we've been able to go to Bernanke and Powell this morning to other factors in a reduced R starred that doesn't get run over by reduced growth. And so we've been able to do this house of cards, if you will. My problem is, is the political posturing totally masks the real discussions that need to be had. Where are the areas of growth that you're investing in where debt is good and where is debt bad, where it's not necessarily creating efficiency and or even, you know, health care, et cetera, that is helping people. How do you fix it? And there just isn't an honest discussion when everyone's just trying to score political points. Never. And that's the problem. That's the problem. We talked about this early this week. If you can get right. two points <clears throat> for passing proper legislation or three points for fighting and fighting's easier. Yeah. Ding, ding, right. ding, I'm going for points, and they are three points for fighting. There's something that's interesting, though, about the fact that Republicans don't think that this is winning points anymore to have the U.S. default, and that is a shift, right? Because all of a sudden, there does not seem to be anyone yeah. saying that this is and positive. And at, at a certain point earlier on, some people were saying, well, maybe it's like, you know, do or die. This is going to be a good would, thing to score political points. No one thinks that anymore. I'd modify that to say some Republicans. To support Ms. Trey's, here's CBO, total receipts. The middle of the pandemic, 16% then 18%, now 20%. So we're getting tax receipts back up to that historical norm, 21, 22. The luxury of issuing treasuries, you get to say a lot of stupid things without many consequences. At least that's been the story so far. In the next hour, Jay Pulaski, who's been buying a little bit of tech. Look out for that conversation. Emily Rowland, alongside Jim Caron and Morgan Stanley from New York. This is Bloomberg. Surveillance on a Friday. Thank you for being with us. One hour to the market open. Lagarde may be pulling equities back here with comments out of Europe. Lisa saw the euro go 107 to a 108 handle. Slightly stronger. We've got to raise rates. But there we are, Lisa. Just in the last 10 minutes, green on the screen. Futures up 12 again. People really have not wanted to buy into this rally. And suddenly <clears throat> the t- tone has shifted this week. And basically it's sort of we've been missing out. And it seems like there's some sustainable trends yeah. under certain aspects of the market. I'm not going to get conviction behind that. There is little conviction anywhere right now. And I think that, that really, yeah. that's what's made this uh, such an interesting yeah. year. My amateur take is it's not fear of missing out. i got to get on board equities. It's much more people who have placed bets short witness the uh, very nice statements from Carl Icahn. It's great when somebody with that esteem comes out and says, oops, I was wrong. Or how about all the people who are waiting to buy the dip and the <clears> dip doesn't come? What do you do yeah. with your cash? Well, that, that, that's the fundamental feature here. The VIX under 16 to me is a huge deal, 15 
5.97. There will be a Fed discussion at 11 a.m. The Bloomberg world will stop. Look to Michael McKee and others for interpretation of a conference, and it will be with the chairman of the Federal Reserve System, which is always of great import. But far more, it will be in honor of an economist who came up with the idea of our start. You know John Williams of the New York Fed. This is Thomas Laubach, who, if you're at Denison University and you're studying economics in German, you know who a German economist is that everyone's talking about. That would be Claudia Somm, and she joins us this morning from Somm Consulting, all her work at Denison in Michigan, about Tom Laubach and this crazy thing, our start. Claudia, I'm going to cut to the chase. Laubach and Williams came up with this theoretical construct that's been a gift because we've had a lower our start, which has allowed us to have a ginormous debt. Do I have that right? Yeah, I think the the level of the interest rates, the quote unquote R star, they they do matter. I mean, one of the big reasons that the deficit, I mean, un, the first year under President Biden, or the second year, you started seeing as the Fed raised interest rates, the cost of servicing some of this debt in the treasuries has been, I mean, that took a hit in the deficit. I mean, we have to, you know, these relationships are there. Uh, I, I will say when we get into our star territory, I get a little uncomfortable just because I think conceptually it is beautiful, but it's not our world right now is not beautiful. So I don't we don't know our star and you've seen the Fed move it around and right. you know, rerun. I just it, it's hard for me to stomach. But if we get to a good place, and they don't raise rates. Hey, I'll take it. What are the ramifications? I totally agree with you that it's a beautiful theory and all that somewhat like DSG and Claret and Gertler. Great. But the fact is we live in the real world, and, and Richard Claret has been very brave to say that. But Claudia Sam, if we get a higher R starred and with the bigger debt and the new higher interest payments a government has to make, does the American house of cards fall apart? I don't think so. If, if there's falling apart in the next few weeks, it's going to be the debt ceiling. Uh, so I, this pressure is putting on the deficit and the government's borrowing this is not my first order of concern. Uh, we went, it is the case that we went from very low interest rates to we moved up really fast. Like the Fed moved the interest rate up and that was feelings about what our star was that they need because they haven't been able to cool off the economy. Like that's very frustrating. And so then they translated to we're getting our star wrong. We push it up. So I just, the logic of it is really tough to see right now. Claudia, today, how, how much should Fed Chair Jay Powell push back against the idea of rate cuts? Can he do anything to make people stop believing that they're going to turn the other way by the end of the year? Oh, he is totally preaching to the choir today in terms of the Fed staying uh, with the high interest rates. I mean, our start, like, there's just no way someone's going to be like, hey, are you going to cut rates so that you are lined up with the markets? I, it's just that's not I think they're going to get a lot of support for what they've done last year and a real drubbing for what they did in 21. On the flip side, Lori Logan of uh, the Dallas Fed came out yesterday and was saying that she's not there yet. The data doesn't really confirm the idea of a pause for her. And she seemed open, very open to another rate hike in in uh, June. I'm wondering from your vantage point, do you think that that could be destructive for the financial system, that the smaller banks that have already experienced some stress could be taken over the edge with an extra 25 basis points? Or do you think that it really would be uh, of little consequence? It was just 25 basis points, right? This is not a make or break in our economy. It, and there, what I've been really impressed with listening to the chatter from the FOMC, and there's been a lot of chatter, uh, you have such a mixed bag. Like Bostic said, he was ready to pause, right? So you have, uh, you have members of the FOMC, participants of the FOMC, who are giving us lots of different messages. And it is so much a relief to know that inside the building, they must be having a very robust debate. And that, that's what we need right now, um, is to make sure people are really, right. really thinking through it. Claudia, you've owned the high ground. I'm going to go to Olivier Blanchard, who uses work out of VCU, and talks about we have an emotional point on inflation where we begin to fall apart. He calls it a sentient point where inflation matters. You are acclaimed for your work on our limited attention about inflation. If we have disinflation... Does America's view of inflation calm down and cool? Yes. And, and not because they're watching the CPI. It's like their lives. I mean, as food prices are going down, that's really important. That's an important piece for households. I, um, I don't think there's a magic number where it all falls apart. 
I think it'll be some external event that causes it to all to fall apart, which the bank, I mean, the turmoil in the banking sector was a real thing. And I was very surprised that they didn't pause while that was like still in motion, like the two meetings ago. Uh, but they're, they are just laser light focused on getting inflation down. And I've been asked, hey, what if they, you know, could they just stop at three on inflation? It's like, <clears throat> no. They're going to two, one way yeah, but, or another. Claudia, but the heart of the matter here, and we say this on the week of the passing of Robert Lucas, the giant of Chicago, Claudia, the fact of the matter is the institution is ex post. How many data points of service sector disinflation do they need to see before they actually do what they should have done X number of months ago? Yeah, so they continue to chop up inflation into the piece they're worried about. Like Supercore did not exist before this, or at least wasn't talked about uh, so broadly. Uh, they, the thing that worries me, and they know this, inflation is the last place that their rate hikes show up because it takes time to filter through the economy. And we've gotten some signs like the producer price index, uh, the looks like the um, mismatch in openings and people searching for work, that's starting to close back. They're getting all kinds of signals about where inflation is gonna be in the next six months. And they're just they're just shrugging it off. It's like, we gotta keep going. We gotta yeah. keep them high. Yeah. So. We're speaking with Claudia Sam, former Federal Reserve economist, uh, about the state of play in monetary policy. A lot of people in the markets have moved on. A lot of the people in the markets are saying the macro story right now isn't really given much. And what we're looking at instead are developments like artificial intelligence and technological advancements that could change the way we work, that change the way we have education, change the way we live. From your vantage point, at the Fed, how much are they looking at some of these technological advancements as either disinflation or inflationary? Cap, like putting it into their model and understanding what is the right parameter to even look at the current data. Yeah, AI is not in the Fed's macro models or its monetary <laughs> policy advice. And, and frankly, I think it's appropriate right now. The Fed is really about stabilizing the business sector. AI and all the, what we tell are going to be amazing innovations, that's five years out, 10 years out. Like that's not going to be big enough to make a dent. Now, it you want them to bring it in when it's clear. I mean, because they do some long-term uh, modeling also, but just like with the supply shocks, they didn't, from COVID and the war in Ukraine, they didn't have good tools or this isn't even in their models to have this kind of supply shock. Well, I guess that this is one of the reasons why a lot of people are saying they just don't know, right? And so that's the reason why their words are kind of holding less clout in the market because they don't know which parameter they're in. They've made that apparently clear. So at what point do you feel like the Fed does have the high ground when it comes to understanding where we are in terms of the macro regime and what era this really relates to? Yeah, they're going to they're going to celebrate the day we hit 2 percent on a sustained basis. It, that, that's what they're looking for. I think they get comfort in some of the numbers. I personally think they've gone past the point of being data driven. I mean, if they're being so like, look at the data, look at the data, that means every time something comes out, the markets react to it. We shouldn't, they shouldn't be creating yeah. volatility. Claudia, we only had you on to get an update on the SOM rule. Explain the SOM rule, trying to game, everybody watching who's trying to game recession is hanging on every word you say, we need a Friday. Some rule update. Let's have it, Claudia. <laughs> How close to recession are we? Nowhere near. Uh, the The unemployment rate rises very slowly, and that that takes some time. And the solemn rule is: if you just have a half a percentage point increase in the unemployment rate relative to the past year, you're in a recession. Two months, three months into a recession. It's not a forecasting tool. It's really about: are we there? And it's zero right now. And, and given how slow unemployment moves, normally COVID was very different, it would take quite a while to get from zero to 0.5. So we're not there. But again, it's an empirical relationship that held in the past. Almost all of our empirical relationships are blowing up in just labor. It was so conflicting with the data. So it's especially tough here. And I do appreciate the humility right. that Powell gives when he talks. Claudia, thank you so much. Claudia Sam, former Federal Reserve economist here as we move to 11 a.m. and an important Federal Reserve moment with Chairman Powell and the former Chairman uh, Bernanke. There are headlines that come out that give pause. The gentleman from Australia will pause.
Morgan Stanley CEO James Gorman is planning to step down within the next 12 months. That is the headline that is currently crossing. You can see that shares of Morgan Stanley lower by about 1.7 percent uh, as you do see that immediate knee-jerk plunge. Remember that they are having their annual uh, shareholder meeting today. So perhaps this is the big takeaway from the whole affair. James Gorman, who has led this company and frankly made some acquisitions that a lot of people uh, really shrugged at, he really expanded. Well, it in a way that took it to a new level. Out of Columbia and then to McKinsey, but with prodigious mathematical skills. And what's interesting here is he is revered, revered for what he did with wealth management and the acquisition of assets for Morgan Stanley. Just one to pick out as Boston's Eaton Vance is, is one example. But uh, to see this, and I should say in the limited headline we have, there's no discussion of the chairman word. So you wonder what that dynamic will be well, uh, as well. How about who the replacement's going to be? What's the bench? Where are they going to look? And then what does this mean in terms of what their longer-term trajectory uh, is, especially after the successful acquisitions right. and their uh, ability? But just to give you a sense, right. this was announced at the annual meeting. So uh, this right. is going to, oh, and this is an answer to your question. He is going to be executive chairman after go. stepping down as chief executive officer. Who could we speak to that could talk about the bench at Morgan Stanley? And that would be all. I don't know, Ellen Zentner or, you know, Jim Karen will be on with John Farrow in the next hour. No, that's not the bench. Expert at the benches of Wall Street firms is our Bloomberg. Someday there'll be CEO correspondent. Shanali Basic joins us. Is this a surprise that Mr. Gorman will step aside? The timeline is certainly a surprise. We knew that it would be coming one day. He's been at the helm for a very long time now. And we know that Morgan Stanley has been prepping the bench for a while. Think about how many people have grown up under James Gorman, have left the firm, and the two men under him right now, Andy Saperstein at the Wealth Business and Ted Pick, they're homegrown. They have been there for a long time. They have been at the most pivotal moments of the firm, up and down. That is, a Ted Pick at the Institutional Securities Division really helped make this tough transition from cutting and adding to the fixed income business, for example, help competing as the top prime broker on Wall Street in the equities business as well. And over at the wealth business, Andy Saperstein, former consultant, longtime lieutenant to James Gorman. Now, the question is, and waiting for the headlines on this, yeah. Did they? At what point are they going to announce who is taking over? Well, let me just read the uh, exact statement. This uh, from Gorman at the firm's annual meeting. He said, it is the board's and my expectation that it will occur at some point in the next 12 months. He's talking about his, uh, his departure as chief executive officer and becoming the chair of the board. That is the current expectation in the absence of a major change in the external environment. Also a key question, was this a decision that he made independently for a lifestyle kind of issue? Was this some sort of strategic shift by the board made basically without necessarily his desiring this departure? You know, I think that's an interesting question. It's hard to have any evidence of something like that. James Gorman has just made this firm into a behemoth. Remember, when I started covering Morgan Stanley, they were worth much less than Goldman Sachs. Now they are worth much more. That divide has just increased <laughs> despite many, many doubts. I remember uh, years ago, I had there was a call, a conference call, and you had, um, you had analysts asking why he wasn't raising the bar more for Morgan Stanley. And you had James Gorman say, stepping back, saying, be patient, we've got this. And ultimately, he, he was right. And so, you know, again, there's been a lot of consistency here, Lisa, when you look at the next level of the firm. And again, I think this is very classic Morgan Stanley fashion. They announce one change. They give you some time to absorb it. Then they announce the next big move. So it's interesting to me the point about unless there is some sort of shift in the market conditions at a time when people have been talking about a financial crisis that never transpired. And now people are talking almost about stasis or this calm that has really percolated out. Is this viewed as sort of a calm period, a pond with the duck sailing across, even if there's <laughs> paddling underneath, where they can actually make shifts like this without any major disruption and do it easily. Well, how fascinating to talk about this right before people are worried about a potential recession. Um, Morgan Stanley has seen some of the worst days through 2008. They remember what it felt like. So this is some calm, isn't it? That is saying it is calm enough <sighs> to start to transition. And oh. by the way, look how many CEOs are changing on Wall Street. This is the time for the next generation to step. Well, okay. Maybe Maybe. Paul Davis wrote this six months ago, five months ago for, for Bloomberg. Thank you to the Washington Post for publishing Paul Davis. 
And he just, it, I, I, I'll never forget the headline. Goldman Sachs is, quote, far, far behind Morgan Stanley. It's all about asset management, right? It's an Eaton Vance thing. I don't know how E-Trades worked out as well. But where does Saperstein fit into that? Because my ba my basic take here is Ted Pick's sort of the older guy. He's got the swagger of Morgan Stanley, and Saperstein is watching paint dry, making all the money. Do I have that right? Uh, it's, it's a pretty good characterization of what's going on. Listen, in the trading business, these are a bunch of loyalists. Uh, this goes back to when Colin Kelleher was there. You yeah, worry yeah. about the traders leaving without a solid person in charge that they trust, that leads the troops. But to your point here on Andy, he also has tens of thousands of financial advisors across the United States. Uh, those are less swashbuckling, let's say, than maybe the traders and investment bankers, but it's steady and uh, and they and they bring in the big bucks, who like you said. Who decides at any firm mm -hmm. who takes over? The board. But remember, as we've been talking about, James Gorman is on that board. Okay, well. fine, he's on the board, but how independent is a Morgan Stanley board versus a guy who many people would suggest is a CEO of the decade yeah. on global Wall Street? I think uh, it's a great question. I, it's my Morgan, only good one of the day, so go with it. Uh, yeah. Morgan, Morgan Stanley's board is pretty diverse and very committed. And remember, uh, they it's changed quite a bit in, in recent years. It has talent from the former uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, from Japan, given their deal with the MUFG during the financial crisis. So it is quite independent relative to a lot of what you're seeing on Wall Street. And that's what kind of makes this succession plan successful in the eyes of Wall Street. It's consistent and it is uh, it is broad and it is diverse in the way it's being sorted through. If you're just joining right now, the news of the day, Morgan Stanley CEO James Gorman is playing to step down within 12 months. This he made in an announcement at the annual meeting. Uh, the shares of the immediate popped lower about 1.7%. They've retraced a lot of that down near the just uh, six tenths of a percent as people digest the news. It does seem like, Shanali, this has been in the works. This has been something they've been planning for, and they pulled the trigger a bit earlier. Is there a sense of shift within the strategy of this company going forward, or do you think it's stay the course, keep the homegrown talent, and keep on plugging away. It's already changed so much. To your point with the big acquisitions, they've always had wealth as a huge driver, asset management. But the asset manager, again, five, six years ago, you couldn't see Morgan Stanley becoming more than a trillion dollars in asset management. That has changed, and it changed quickly with acquisitions. So they've, they've already changed. The question is, if they choose oh. one man or the other, which part of the bank could suffer from any potential attrition or concerns around who's leading. Off the BQ screen, Goldman Sachs, 1.03 price to book. Morgan Stanley and James Diamond, like 1.53. And I, I'm sorry, the guy is so modest that he's underplayed what he did with managing money. I mean, that to me is just the, the massive theme here. And you, you've said that he will stay as an executive chairman? Yeah, he's going to be chair. What do they do? What do they do? What do executive chairmen do? <laughs> they sit around and they make sure that nothing goes wrong and they come back if, it, if things do go wrong. I mean, listen, okay. the initial market reaction tells you a lot. He's <clears> iconic <throat> uh, at the helm of Morgan Stanley. He's changed the firm more yeah. um, than any other bank has changed in the last year. Shanelle, thank you. She is our chief Wall Street correspondent. There's no other way to put it here. And uh, it'll be interesting to see, to say uh, the least. Patiently waiting, which is what you do when you're in economics at the London School of Economics, as we... Uh, look at what's going on on Wall Street is Kay Ujin. She has been absolutely spectacular about the synthesis of the political economics and the changing political economics uh, in China. And as you do with Elizabeth Economy, now working in commerce in the U.S., there are books where you say, oh, damn, this is the one this weekend. The New China Playbook, Beyond Socialism and Capitalism, Kay Ujin, it is the academic read of the moment on China. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us in New York. Thank you, Tom. Uh, just simple. Where'd the capitalism go, that model of Chinese capitalism, and what does the new post-capitalism look like in China? Capitalism is uh, still there. It's just never going to be above politics. And there's going to be more regulation, more monitoring going in the, going forward. Uh, China's going to avoid trying to become an American-style capitalist society. I want to be a bigger and smarter Germany, focusing on industrial technical power. There are new goals uh, in the new era, a new generation to shape uh, the contours of the economy. 
Lots of going things going on. We got some news about Alibaba as one example of one of their capitalist success stories, spinning out their cloud business, potentially because of some of the stress they were coming under from the Chinese Communist Party. How much is this new push hampering the economic capitalist push that it's been focusing on for a number of decades? It's going to be a constant struggle, a tension between more growth, more innovation, and more regulation. And what we're seeing is China, China's uh, government coming down pretty harsh on um, kind of uh, monitoring or uh, uh, trying to prevent monopolies and pr protecting consumer data. But, you know, you know the economy is in its worst state, so they need the private sector and they need innovation. I'm going to ask a really unfair question. Are people happy? Ask people on the street, and I think overwhelmingly a positive yes. Really? So this is actually very much against the common feeling in a lot of Western media that people are kind of buckling under the constraints of some of the censorship and the oversight. Right. You're saying that on the ground, people like this direction, that they think that it is the correct way to go. Well, the last three years haven't been helpful. So people have been unhappy, especially towards the end. But in general, if you ask any random person, they will feel like, you know, you know, my kids are getting educated and their opportunities. My future is pretty bright until recently. But things are opening up. So that's changing. All right. So we're talking here about China as you have the G7 meeting taking place with a lot of Western leaders getting together and trying to figure out how to compete more directly with China, except to keep it from becoming antagonistic. Mm -hmm. Can you get a sense of just how antagonistic this is getting, especially given the, the sort of Central European or Central Asian meeting that Xi Jinping is holding on the other side? Yeah, the temperature needs to be taken down. But we have to be, understand that different countries view the security and economy in different ways. They view China differently. And China understands that heterogeneity. And so um, going forward, you know, the U.S. and China tensions are really important. But we see the leaders trying to take the temperature down as well. But misunderstandings don't help. And they have to keep an open dialogue. Communication is absolutely key. Does China still want to be the number one economy, or is that kind of off the table? If, the, if China can grow fast, 1.5 percentage points faster than the U.S., which is is feasible still, it will become the largest economy in a little over 10 years. Don't Let's not underestimate the 600 million people in China today that is still with less than $300 of income per month. That's a huge boost to consumption power. We've been talking about Morgan Stanley and uh, James Gorman stepping down. This relates to the China story because there has been a lot of discussion about Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, among other Western banks, getting out of China, that the temperature there has gotten a little too hot for them and the political interference. How much is this China growth going to happen without Western companies participating, without Western companies really having much of a presence there at all? No, China absolutely needs Western companies, Western investors there. Um, but I'd say that the financial system is actually the sector where China is most open to welcoming foreign. Lots of licenses handed out to foreign institutions. It's just currently the, the severe loss of confidence uh, for our private businesses are holding, are making investors hold back. Okay, Jen, thank you so much for joining thank us you, uh, today. We're the London School of Economics. I really can't say enough about the new China playbook. It's just the right size to get a huge perspective here on all the changes going on uh, in China. We need to return to an historic moment on Wall Street, James Gorman announcing at their annual meeting that he will uh, move away from duties as a chief executive officer. It would be good to speak to someone who arched from John Mack to James Gorman, and that would be Allison Williams, of course, leading all of our banking coverage at Bloomberg Intelligence. Allison, what a shift in the Morgan Stanley of John Mack and before to what James Gorman wrought. What did he wrought? He really shifted the business towards wealth management and away from sort of the more volatile institutional business of trading and investment banking. And, and to be clear, even though um, there has been this shift and there is this focus at the firm, uh, the institutional business has still thrived under Gorman. And I think the changes today are sort of a natural progression. It was about two years ago that uh, the firm had named Ted Pick and Andy Saperstein as co-presidents. Those are the, mm -hmm. the heir apparents. Um, and Ted Pick really having transformed uh, the institutional business. He, start, he did a great job with fixed income trading, took over equity trading, and sort of moved up. Um, and Andy Saperstein uh, running uh, the, the bigger wealth side of the business. David uh, Brooks in the New York Times, Allison Williams, wrote an essay years ago about the smooth guys versus the nerds. 
And so you've got, as a generalization, the romance of banking, the meet and greet of banking, the transactional nature of banking versus managing money and picking up a fee along the way. Which has the high ground at Morgan Stanley right now? And can they both coexist given whoever becomes CEO? I think they, they can coexist. It is, it is sort of the latter that has grown in importance, uh, the, uh, the wealth and recurring fee business. Um, and I think, um, you know, Shanali was talking about sort of the stock of Morgan Stanley versus the stock of, of Goldman Sachs under Gorman's reign. And from an investor standpoint, the investors do tend to favor a more stable recurring revenue type business, and that is more the wealth and asset management business. Uh, we always like to remind people that it's a business not immune to market pressures. If the, if the market has a, a dramatic, dramatic downfall, that will reduce those fees. Um, but uh, as we saw during the pandemic, uh, in very volatile times, the uh, banking businesses, the M&A and equity underwriting, if you will, um, those can actually come to a halt. And so that's you know, the big asset base, uh, the trillions of dollars yeah. that um, they've garnered, that won't go away overnight. Allison, can you speak to what Shanali Basak was talking about? This is the time for younger blood to take the helm, for people who have been in charge for years to step aside. Is that really the feeling that you're, you're seeing uh, percolate on Wall Street? I think... It it is story by story, but it is, um, I think, a time, you know, um, also, as, as you all were discussing, it is a time of, of relative stability, right? There's always uncertainty. There's always concerns about the economy. There's always concerns about monetary policy. But I think you do want to sort of pass the baton in a relatively calmer period. We saw this with Lloyd Blankfein, um, if you recall, um, several years ago when he said, you know, th things are stable right now. It's time to pass the baton before we kind of go into um, the next round of some kind of volatility. And that was the right move, right? So when the pandemic took hold, right. David Solomon had been, been in place. And I, so I think Gorman is making those comments. You did see that he gave the caveat, you know, if there is some kind of disruption, he left that door open, um, that it will be a smooth transition. Allison, thank you so much. I know a busy day for you. Allison Williams of Bloomberg Intelligence on the news that Mr. Gorman will uh, step aside as CEO. There's another major story going on right now, and it is moving markets. Futures up 15, Dow futures up 105, and the VIX in a big, big amount from 15.97 and 0 .10. That's a big move, 15.87. And these are stunning headlines at the conference that Powell and Bernanke will be with Thomas Laubach's colleague, John Williams of the New York Fed. And Lisa, the, this is really strong statement in writing by John uh, Williams. He speaks of the relaunch of the R-Start rate, R-Start interest rate back to pre-pandemic level. And really the, the, the very key headline, pandemic didn't end era of very low rates. There's your market lift. Echoing what we heard from the IMF and everybody poo-pooed what the IMF had to say. You guys are stuck in the olden days. And here comes John Williams saying the same thing. We're going right back to there, which really was the belief that a lot of people in the market has uh, as well. However, that said, what does this mean in terms of what Fed policy is? Well, I, remains to be seen. And you see this off of what we saw from Lagarde two hours ago, moving Euro 107, 108, where they're going to go to higher rates to calm a much more difficult inflation. But this, is, what are we going to see from Bernanke and Powell here at 11 a.m.? The implication from John Williams is they're going to hold rates as high as they need to hold them to get us back down to a level that they see as the same as it was before the pandemic, despite some of the discussion about a new era. The headline there, the pandemic didn't end era of very low rates. That from John Williams of San Francisco in New York. Much, much more to come on Bloomberg Television on the Pacific Rim. Jay Pulaski, good morning.